All right. Hey, thanks for joining us again on the Gill Athletics Connections Track and Field Podcast. Man, I'm super excited. We have had some amazing guests these past few weeks. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying them and um, hope you're excited about today's guest. From time to time, uh, you know, we've had coaches from around the world on the podcast and today's no different. I got a coach, but this coach is, uh, he's a little bit special uh, because not only is he has been a coach for a long time, an athlete, we're going to learn a lot about him, uh, specifically talking a lot about pole vault, but he's actually a teammate of mine. Now, before I get to him, we're going to talk a lot of pole vaulting. Like I said today, this, uh, this guy's the guru in pole vaulting. So buckle up, uh, but just wanted to bring your attention in the month of February, one of the biggest expenses when you're buying vaulting poles is the shipping. So Gill Athletics for the month of February, so you still got a few weeks left here, uh, any poll order of two or more from our Pacer lineup, our Pacer 1, our Pacer FXV, and our Pacer comp, uh, Composite uh, uh, FX vaulting poll, we're going to do free shipping here in the 48 states. So uh, make sure to call your preferred authorized Gill dealer, and uh, let's get free shipping here in the month of February. Okay, the commercial's over. I know you're super excited. You've already seen uh, who our guest is today. Please help me welcome uh, my good friend, the wise and wonderful Brian Carell. Brian, how are you? Oh, good. That commute down those 22 stairs to here was, was tough. <laughs> yeah, you know, normally uh, we're doing these over Zoom. And while we certainly are recording for, for the YouTube channel, if you'd like to, to watch these interviews, which I'm always surprised why anybody would watch them, because that means you got to stare at my face for upwards of two hours. Uh, and this got doubly worse with you here. Sure. Uh, but this is fun. This is like, if you are watching us on YouTube, we're actually in the same room, which is um, a, a rarity in the COVID days, you know? You know, we've spent our fair share of uh, time together in various places at events and had our, our uh, this is this is just a conversation being recorded that we've probably had a million times. This is like a, a meeting uh, here, in, here at Gill. <laughs> Or, or a, a, a championship event after, yes. after hours yes. at Lots the house of fun. we rented or you know, over barbecue or That's whatever That's right. It is. Lots of fun. You know, that the doing those NCAA meets, uh, you know, as we're the official equipment sponsor, a uh, ton of fun, right? I mean, we have seen some like literally amazing performances all on our equipment, which just, you know, so humbling. Uh, but the work that goes into it. No one knows if you haven't seen, and really, you know, full disclosure, it's Brian. It's not me. I, I kind of just, he puts me to the side makes me put starting blocks together. Uh, but the work that goes you are really good at putting together starting blocks. That's why we trust you to do it. <laughs> a lot of experience. <laughs> uh, well, Brian, this isn't about me. We're here. Uh, I really am so thankful, you know, to uh, be able to talk to you and share your story and your journey in track and field because it is really in depth. You have a lot, as we're going to learn today, a lot of different roles that you have played in track and field. Why don't we start uh, talking about what you do for Gill, how long you've been here. You've had a couple of different roles throughout that long career. So why don't we start and not necessarily how you got to Gill, because we'll get to that as we go through biography, but what, what do you do for Gill and what are some of the things that you've done for us here? Uh, well, I started off in sales. I was in sales for a uh, many years, I, I want to say 12, 13 years uh, ish. Um, that's still, I, you know, I still have a lot of people that, that I talk to in the sales side of things, even in my new position as um, kind of an R and D. Uh, I work with the R and D team. Uh, uh, I'm a, in a department of two in field service. Um, we help with uh, prototyping, uh, product development, um, and in, uh, in the, those occasions where something might go a little awry in the field, uh, myself or my coworker uh, have to troubleshoot over the phone. And if we can't solve it that way, we jump on a plane, jump in a car, uh, we go on site and we, we kind of make things work. So most people know of Gill Athletics, especially on the Gill Athletics podcast, right? Uh, but we actually, little known secret, we have a sister brand, if you will, Porter Athletic, which is a lot of basketball and volleyball, ceiling suspended curtains. If you think about your indoor gymnasium, do you ever have to do troubleshooting and things like that for those products? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, like I said, we're a department of two. So uh, it's not uncommon for us to uh, uh, have to cover for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ralph Paquin, if he's out in the field driving around, uh, and then another call comes in, I have to step in. Um, and the same thing, Ralph has been with the company way longer, probably twice as long as I have. 
Uh, and uh, so he, he can absolutely fill any of the, the gill questions. I, where I've, with, with our Porter brand, we have some electronic items that, hmm. you know, uh, I have to rely a lot on our R&D team as well to, to help out. Now, you, you mentioned Ralph, who is amazing. One day I got to have him on the podcast because he does have some, I mean, deep history within inside of Gill Athletics. Uh, but you mentioned he's been here doubly long as you. Now, I'm going on 15 years at Gill, and you were already here when I got here. So how long have you been here at Gill? Uh, I just had my, my 20th anniversary with the company um, back in July, so 20 and a half years. Wow. You're old. So are you. Yeah, by the way, lots of inside <laughs> jokes I fully expect. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and apologize for all the inside jokes that are that are going to occur today. Yeah, Brian's been here 20 years, and that's amazing. One of the aspects that you mentioned, and it, it really is one of the, like when people ask me about what it's like to work at Gill, one of the aspects that I talk about a lot, because it, to me it's the most fun, is that R&D aspect of it. And you have been, even before you were officially in the R&D department, uh, you know, as sales, we have a lot of input and ideas and, uh, you know, we break a lot of stuff uh, in R&D. What is it, what are some of the things that you've worked on that people would know uh, that in the R&D capacity? Uh, well, you know, I've got, it's funny that I'm a, I'm a pole vault guy and my, my actual, um, uh, my, my, I have patents in, with hurdles. I have two patents in my name, uh, some ideas that I had that, that we developed. Uh, so I, but I don't have anything to do with pole vaulting. <laughs> but is you know being involved in, in certain projects, uh, our new pole vault standard. I, mm. I helped uh, out with a lot of the uh, a lot of the things to do with that. Um, I, I mean going back uh, the stackable rocker hurdle, you know, our oh, yeah, hurdle, that that's was right. Of, proposal in one of our meetings you probably remember yeah um you know I, I everybody's involved at some level you know it's just mm -hmm. the end and uh i always thought it was funny when i did move up to working with the r d team they had a a little uh, a mantra that they called their get fired fridays so on on fridays they used to sit come up with ideas they had their own little meeting and, and come up with those ideas that they were too embarrassed to to maybe say in a group uh and they were just called it you know I would get fired if I said this at right. any time. So it was their get fired Friday meetings. And a lot of uh, uh, neat things came out of, out of that. Yeah. And people don't know it because it was just their little thing. But a lot of neat ideas came out of that as well. See, I didn't, I, here I am. I've been here 15 years. I didn't know about this R&D only get fired Friday. See, I, I didn't either. I was a sales yeah. and when I moved up there and they were telling me about it. So see, they were smart enough to know that, oh, we just need to have like, let's not just be out in front of, you know, the big bosses and everything. I just go straight to the bosses like, hey, man, what if we had a 3D hologram hurdle? How cool would that be? And then it's like, Mike, just stay over, go, 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 go somewhere and travel. Get out of here. What My are you favorite is you're electrified. <laughs> <laughs> keep people from turning the goals down just hook electricity up to it so that might still get patented so i don't know that we want to talk about a brilliant idea by okay. the way of uh electrified football goalposts because i do have a real passion for the people because when i was at ball state we, we had a terrible losing streak in football and they they won one finally right now we're going to learn you you graduated from indiana state so you're you're yeah, so very familiar with long history. losing streaks right uh, and so when we won, the, finally, they tore down the goalpost. Very traditional, right? We've seen it on TV a hundred times. Uh, but what happens, normally when you're watching, you see it and, you know, you're excited and you move on. You don't actually know about the aftermath. Almost every time, I shouldn't say that, but a lot of the times when a goalpost is pulled down, someone gets hurt tremendously. And at that Ball State game, uh, someone, the, the football goalpost, when it breaks, because it just suddenly snaps, spoiler alert it's not designed for people to hang on yeah, uh pretty darn heavy they're extremely heavy uh it fell down and hit a kid and he was paralyzed and so you know that stuck with me it's like man when i got here and you know we make football go posts it's like what can we do and you know uh you know, my best solution was the electrified i also came up with the well what if we pushed a button and uh petroleum jelly or something you know make it slippery right i mean there's a couple of ideas there because uh one of the things that you mentioned that i'm still i don't that, know that's that's got to be southern heritage oh for sure a for greased sure pole. Right. A greased, a greased pole. pole exactly one of the things that you mentioned that i don't know if you know i'm extremely jealous of i don't get jealous of a lot of things but one of the things that i really desire in my career here at gill is to have a patent and you have you have two right 
dude. And that's for, for our um, the automatic, our new continuum automatic, right? Yeah, that I'm extremely jealous. They're both, they're both the, tr the trigger mechanism. There's a patent involved. Oh, and the trigger too. In the actual yeah. internal yeah. workings. Was, yeah. I, I'm always trying to be in as many R&D meetings as possible. So I can say, I can latch on to it. Like, well, I think, I think I mentioned that. And so if it goes to patent, I can get on there. I want one of those plaques. I'm super, do you have the plaques? I, I, I did not buy the plaques. Oh, I would, I'd buy the big jumbo I, plaque. Carry it with me. You know, you remember, um, I have a certificate. do you remember uh, uh, Flavor Flav, the watch? Yeah. Oh yeah, I would put it, it, I'd wear it as like the necklace. Heck yeah, man. So when this hit, when this particular uh, interview hits on YouTube and you get that big, you're going to wear your YouTube plaque. Right? <laughs> you got to be, uh, you know, Rob Lasorsa's YouTube video went 20,000 plus views. So we got a while to, to catch up to Mr. Lasorsa on the, on the I, podcast. I don't think that's yeah, I don't either. <laughs> I think me, you, and mom might, we might watch it. We'll, yeah. we'll get three views, uh, but we'll get a few more listens. But um, so you mentioned R&D, which is really a lot of fun. Some frustration too, right? Because you're trying to create something from new. And usually when I travel, it's because something's wrong. And that's right. Never a fun, right. But I get to meet a lot of interesting people. And yeah. See a lot of uh, like really interesting places. Um, I, I, you probably will ask a question about this, but I'll uh, uh, seeing uh, seeing kind of the Oregon project throughout yeah. several stages. I was able to. I, I had to go out there on well, three or four different occasions. Tell me about that, because you know. Um, I have never seen it. I've never been there. I'm going to go next month, thank goodness. Or by the time this airs, it'll be right when I'm going. Uh, super excited. Seen lots of pictures and video. You have been there from when it was dirt, like when they tore um, historic Hayward down. So what's it like out there and with all the equipment and stuff? So I have, I have a photo still on my phone to this day. Uh, so when we wrapped up the NCAA championships uh, the previous year, um, they, we, we knew that when we left that facility, they were chaining it up, trying to keep mm -hmm. people from coming in and, and trying to chain themselves to the facility. Uh, uh, and uh, they were going to begin demo like that following day or that week. Right. And so I took a photo, literally just kind of add casually as I was walking out, turned, snapped a photo. And like that, I knew that it was like one of the last photos going to be taken of the facility because we were some of the last people. Right. Um, and then I got to go back, you know, kind of saw the the typical online postings of, of the progress. Uh, when we went back the first time, we were working on um, their indoor throws cage, mm. and so the the pro the above ground project was still um, I wouldn't even say maybe halfway complete, it, maybe a little more, a little less. It was there was like the surface wasn't down, mm. and. Uh, we were working down there and getting some stuff put in the ceiling and and these people came in while we were there the same week we were there and it was the uh they call them the graffiti artists but oh, right. the, the one this one young lady that was in there she was a muralist she was very adamant that we not call her a graffiti artist <laughs> uh so i think what uh i think one of the really interesting things that people are going to see when they finally get into that that facility is is all of the uh the custom art that mm. is all over the facility mm -hmm. uh, they had i don't remember the number but it was the 40 or 50 different uh local graffiti and, and muralists that were really in, and do, they did the bathrooms they did the wall downstairs in the training area they did i mean it is there is some uh some really cool stuff to see walking through. I, I didn't know there was that many because i've seen a couple of pictures of that graffiti that you're talking about because what's interesting to well, me just the one wall down by pole yeah i think there were five or six different artists down there oh, at, at various wow. times that we were there that week because so. what seems to be interesting from the videos uh, following them on instagram and twitter and stuff um in the pictures and such is like this duality of this um modern you know graffiti uh you know very um like the stuff in a classy way, what you see on the uh, trains and stuff like that, but, you know, artistic, but also this conservative, like a lot of wood and, um, you know, that kind of stuff that seems more in their tradition, if you will, of, of, of Hayward. And get ready for lots of green. Oh, yeah, sure. There is a lot, <laughs> uh, indoors, especially there. Is lots yeah. Of green. <laughs> so. Well, uh, the pictures make it seem 
like overall for the whole facility, they did an amazing job. Of course, you know, I won't break my arm patting ourselves on our back that, uh, you know, the pits and hurdles and gosh, everything, right. Uh, you know, we, we did some pretty cool new things. They really pushed us, them and Nike, uh, pushed us hard. Uh, we know from, uh, living through it, but so thankful, you know, that they would choose us and, uh, it, it's going to be amazing. I'm super excited for June. Like I can't wait for multiple reasons, right? Like we missed outdoor last year. I can't wait to have an outdoor track season, but to get to Oregon, and just see it all come together and see the faces of all the kids, the athletes and coaches that'll be there for the first time. Like that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And you, and, and you and I, we travel a lot. We go visit uh, uh, construction. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, where was it? Um, down in Birmingham. We went on their track while they were laying the rubber. You and I went out. Uh, UAB. Oh, UAB. Yeah. We went mm -hmm. to UAB. We went to... Uh, you know, I kind of saw Miami's track. Mm -hmm. We we went and visited Texas A&M when they were mm -hmm. doing their mm -hmm. research. So we've seen a lot of that construction. So when I saw what Oregon was doing, you know, it was kind of a little bit, everybody wants to one-up everybody else. Well, Oregon just one-up the world. Like, <laughs> that stadium is, is That's just, a good way of putting it. Just, um, you know, there are certainly some Olympic stadiums that were built that, right. that are bigger but i don't think they're more grandiose right they're, not, they're the just the um the very intentional attention to detail yeah and, and i'll use the word the excess mm -hmm. that they went to to uh to make the the building special mm -hmm. um is i just don't see how anybody's not going to just be in awe you're, you're yeah. going to go back to three some some coaches are going to be going back two three times and like go i never saw that before mm, the, the, that's cool so much detail in, in yeah the, the things that are going on out there, so. well you, you mentioned excess but you know honestly and i and i think you'd agree with this you know i love it like i i would rather be talking about the excesses of another track facility than remember when uh, jerry's world came out you know the big tv uh, the big screens oh, the yeah. dallas cowboy and everybody's like oh the excess right and it's like yeah that's great that was for football and you know i like i like college football not nfl but I love seeing like, oh, did you really have to do this uh, for a track facility? Yeah. You know what? Let's let's get more money and resources into our sport. Right. Um, so you mentioned the travel and you, you do, you know, you've done things, everything from pit garages to ha hanging ceiling uh, curtains. I, of course I would. Um, things like that. Where, you know, let's carve out Oregon since we just talked about Oregon, but where and maybe what was it for has been some of your most interesting travels that you've had for Gil. I mean, you've done summits, you've done um, uh, pole vault specific street vaults, you've done, of course, NCAAs, Olympic trials, et cetera. What's been kind of like, man, you know what? This was a lot of fun. You, you, uh, you made it easy to answer and then you made it impossible to answer. <laughs> uh, you know, as far as is here with Gill, uh, the NCAA events, and uh, previously with USATF, the, those championship mm. events are are so challenging, but so rewarding. And, um, you know, I, I had a, a this, I'll do the Albuquerque story. <laughs> um, so we, uh, uh, the Jen Schur's indoor world record. Mm, yeah. Um, I happen to have a good data plan on my phone. And so literally like I videoed that and uploaded it for right. 30 seconds of it happening. Uh, and then of course stood very attentively waiting uh, <laughs> for her to either jump higher or miss that third attempt. Right. And when everybody rushed out to congratulate Jen and, and uh, you know, get a, get those photos of her next to the, the video board and all that. I'm sitting over on the pit, holding onto the crossbar. Mm. <clears throat> the like, crossbar she set the record on. Yeah. yeah. yeah the crossbar, like I kept an eye on it. <laughs> I knew that they didn't change it out. Right. I, I held onto that crossbar. <laughs> uh, I went and got, a, got her to her and, and um, uh, Mary Saxer and, and Kylie. Uh, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. First, second, third. Uh, not in that order. Maybe that order. Mm -hmm. Anyway, got their autographs on it. Oh yeah. Uh, put clear tape on it, and to this day, it's, it's hanging upstairs yeah. in the R and D area. I, I didn't know Mary and Kylie were on there too. I, I mean, I you know I knew their place. I didn't know he had them, but I knew Jens, of course, was so on yeah, there. So yeah, being the the equipment nerd that I am, you know, everybody's like, "Woo, let's go say congrats." I'm I'm over. <laughs> Good job, Jen. I got the bar. And, you know, I didn't want everybody That's else to get cool. off with that. So. Yeah. Um, but in the bigger picture of of what were some of the cool things I've done, I you know thinking back, I think 
you know, we set up a, an exhibition pole vault competition and a Dave Matthews concert one time. That was just crazy cool. Wait, what? I, I don't know this. <laughs> so, was this for Gil or? So uh, our very good friend, uh, better friend to you probably than me, but I, I've probably known him a little longer, but Marshall Goss used to run oh, the yeah. same fair pole vault mm -hmm. competition. Uh, and uh, he, it, it became overwhelming for him one year and he quietly just wasn't going to do it. And uh, I reached out to him and said, Hey, uh, where, what's, when's the vault? And he, uh, he said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do it this year. I'm like we have to do it. Mm -hmm. Who do I call? I'll do it. I'll take it over. And that's kind of how the Indiana state fair pole vault competition huh. got handed off from Marshall to me. Right. Um, because of that, you know, people at the fair would see it and, uh, I guess the event promoters um, called somebody in the Indianapolis area uh, asking for neat things because they wanted a, kind of a carnival atmosphere at mm. this outdoor venue. Uh, so we, I got a call saying, hey, would you like to pull vault to the Dave Matthews concert? So as, as the people were coming in the, the facility uh, off to their right was the back end of a pole vault pit and we just kept jumping. It wasn't. It wasn't a competition. We just vaulted. And uh, we was the concert going on? Uh, this was as they were fil filtering in. When the concert okay. Started. Yeah, yeah. All the fanfare closed down. Right. We had VIP passes to go to the concert wow. backstage. Uh, and uh, it was a yeah. It was a it was a very very tiring long event. Um, and uh, but it was a lot of fun. And then the other kind of the state fair was always fun. That was an annual thing. Right. And then the other kind of, I think it's the only time it's ever been done. We reached out, uh, uh, Indianapolis has this event called Circle Fest. Mm -hmm. And so from Monument Circle, they shut down two blocks every direction. Mm -hmm. And down, and then they have a beer garden in the mm -hmm. center. <clears throat> and so they, uh, down each way, they have kind of a different, at least this is how it used to be, you have a different uh, band, type of band, mm -hmm. like a mm -hmm. rock band here, country here, right. a little maybe hip hop down here right but in the one entryway they didn't really have any bands and they asked if we wanted to set up and it that was the most challenging setup i've ever done i was gonna say they say setup like it's <laughs> uh you know a couple of hurdles or something this is a freaking pole vault pit yeah. and the standards and a runway yeah. yeah this ain't no simple setup so the i wasn't allowed to start setting up until after midnight and we had to be done by i think 6 a.m oh so, and then, man and then vault and then and of course what they were hoping was that we would allow uh, people to try it, which we did kind of, but the problem was we didn't realize how early and how much people would drink before they would come <laughs> over. So, uh, so it was a very- Were you given sobriety tests before they no, could try? We, we, uh, <laughs> uh, we actually had about halfway through thought we should have been charging a dollar a jump or something. Yeah, so right. In great shape. Uh, so, the, so we go through the whole day, we vault, of course now we're exhausted because we did the yeah early morning setup we we vaulted as exhibition most of the day and uh so now it's um at midnight you weren't allowed to start taking anything out of the 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 blocks until midnight and wow you had to be done by i think it was three so we had three hours to yank we we didn't make it we literally just stacked a bunch of runway sections up on the, that side, is on a the sidewalk and then damn. quietly came back and and finished with those are two of the, wow. the probably the more wild. Um, yeah, you know, th there's been uh, beach vaults, and, mm -hmm. and you know, like, I haven't been personally in, but I, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody jumping at a concert. Yeah. Um, certainly, the Circle Fest is is a very different than kind of the fairs and stuff that mm -hmm. are out there, but but it's it falls kind of the same. Thing. But that was fun. Those were. I'm going to ask this by Do you remember? But I know you'll remember this when we had the field fest right outside here yeah. and Jen was either jumping for an American or world record must've been world record. Right. And Christian Cantwell had just thrown like 72 feet yeah. in the, uh, in the shop that we were doing shot. Actually we did discus that year too. Uh, and so it was just so cool right outside of our factory out in the cornfield, in the cornfield. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that event uh, ended with a world leading mark in mm -hmm those two events yeah yeah for sure i remember the shot and I, yeah i guess so if she was going for world record i probably was a world leader yeah, yeah. that was really amazing i mean it, it was a lot of work oh man for yeah. everybody and don't ask we're not putting it back yeah. on so, that's for sure yeah Oof, but man. yeah that was a 
I, I love how that that was uh, <laughs> the comment was made. Well, yeah, it's it's just too big. We can't manage this anymore. But hey, Brian, you're welcome to keep doing it. You know, <laughs> yeah. Annual, if you'd like. yeah, man, that <laughs> oh, was so, amazing. So me by myself now. That would be awesome. That's amazing. So. Unbelievable. Well, you mentioned Indianapolis a couple times, um, and Indiana itself, which plays a lot into your story. And who you know where you came up from and how you got here to Gill. So let's uh, why don't we take a step back? Uh, it, spoiler: This is going to all be about pole vaulting, by the way. Uh, although I may crack a couple of distance jokes at him uh, because he was a phenomenal cross country runner. Um, and I, I proved it. No, you, see, this is where the <laughs> inside jokes come, and I don't know how far to go with the the paper that he showed me, folks. But uh, so let's let's take a step back. When did you've been in track and field forever? Uh, when did it actually start and how did track become a part of your life back in high school, middle school? Where did it begin? Well, I was, I was, uh, I was born in Gary, Indiana. I lived in Merrillville for a while. And, and uh, when I was in elementary school, they'd have field days. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in my little elementary school, uh, I was fast. I was one of the faster kids in the school, but I wasn't fast. Like mm -hmm. right. kind of like big fish in a little pond, mm -hmm. you know, big pond and go, yeah, I'm not that good. <laughs> so uh, we moved from, uh, my mom was an IRS agent. She got a promotion. We moved from, uh, uh, she used to commute to South Bend, but we moved to, to Indianapolis and moved into Greenwood, Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got to know a few guys who ran track. And so I'm in, I'm in junior high at this mm -hmm. point. And uh, so I, sorry about that. Um, so my, my friends all encouraged me and, and the way the, the tryouts went, we saw tryouts and cuts. So for, for track. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cause it was a big track team. Exactly. Um, or it was looking back now, I was a kid at the time. Maybe it was just a really crotchety old coach. who didn't <laughs> want too many kids on the team. Right, right, right. Um, so, uh, I, I go through the tryouts and the tryouts were where you basically tried out for everything. Okay. There's certain kids they knew they were going to do something, but everybody tried out for everything. So you did a little bit of shot putting, yeah. jump, long ran, jumping, ran. Yeah. Did you do hurdles? Uh, did not do hurdles. Mm, yeah, you missed I, out. Okay. You know, I think he knew better than to <laughs> take a bunch of junior high kids and just throw them at the hurdles as right. a tryout. Um, and I, I, so I made it through the first cuts, mm -hmm. came back, and they had a they they did a little pole vaulting, and I I just one of my other friends had done it uh, previously and, and um, I really liked it and I, and I thought I was pretty good at it, but I, I, you know, it didn't go well. Sure. Had you seen pole vaulting before or was this the first time you had oh, seen man. it? Like you'd seen it at Olympics or anything like that? I had to guess. I, I'd never seen it before in my life. And I, so when you saw it for this first time, was there like an immediate, I mean, cause this, you know, spoiler alert, your whole life has been pole vaulting, my friend. So like, I wonder what was that first reaction when you saw it? Or was it like you had to grow into the love or was it immediate? Like, Oh yeah, I want to do this. Well, I think it was more, I wanted to be a part of the team. Mm. I, I didn't care if I was good at pole vaulting. Yeah. Or okay. Or, uh, I heard I wasn't very good at hiking. <laughs> uh, hurdles if I'd ever, you know, right. I just wanted to be a part of the team. Yeah. I, I had made, I had established some friends, you know, obviously track is a, later in the school year. So I wanted to be, I wanted mm. to continue to do what these guys were doing. Right. Um, and uh, so the second cuts come out and this had been after we had tried pole vault. I think, they, I think the trials were like over a week Okay. and I got cut. And oh uh, no. So we were getting ready to go. How have I not known this to make fun of you for the past 15 years? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, oh man. So, but you're I, like, you're like Jordan. I was, <laughs> I was, I kind of felt like I was doing well, I was not, you know, up with the top three or four guys, but I was, you know, picking up on it pretty quick. Uh -huh. And so I went to the coach and I was devastated. And I, and I just, mm -hmm. they, they were getting ready to go on spring break. So the, they have this spring break time where they would continue to practice. Um, and the practices were voluntary mm -hmm. uh, because he knew kids were going to be gone. And, yeah, but break. then they would start their, they would start the season once they got back from spring break. I mean, not many states have junior high track anyways so mm -hmm. our season was pretty small but so I asked him and I said you know I, I feel like I was this pole vault thing was going pretty good could I come to practices over spring break and he he kind of begrudgingly was like yeah 
but you're not on the team. Mm -hmm. You know, he kind of said, you're still cut. Mm -hmm. End of that week, he came up to me and I, I was now beating the best guy. You know, like my pr progress just kept going. And uh, I was now, if he cut me, he was cutting the number one pole vaulter. Right. And he kind of recognized that. And he was like, why don't you stick around? And I, I went on that year to never place worse than third. And I got a, several first and second place ribbons. And so what, going. that's a great story of like, but I just had to admit to you that I got cut. I know. I love that. Uh, I'm going to put it on our, we have a company wide announcements. You know, I'm going to you know what's going to come up. If you do that. No, no, that's, that's, that's one inside joke that doesn't come out of here. So what I love that story of perseverance of first of all, that you got cut, which, which come on for any any person, not just kid, that's a devastating thing when you're not accepted into a group. So you, you, there was a devastation there, but you didn't, like, there, there was no quit. It was like, but well, let me go back. Any, you know, anybody that knows me would just go, Brian, stubborn. Yeah, well, Shocker, yeah, yeah, well, that's true. I, I, uh, I've been stubborn. But I, I love life. that. And then, so, so this all occurred over a week, though, not like a I, month. It was, it was two, about two and a half weeks. The, the, because the, you know, the week of spring break were, he kind of said, you're not on the team. Right. And the tryouts were oh, okay. a week and a half long. So okay. It, I, I tried out for a lot of other what? things. Because so. back then we didn't have YouTube and, you know, access to any kind of like, right now, if a kid gets cut and go on YouTube and he can kind of see what to do in vault or another event and kind of get better that way. Or go to a club. Or, or go to a club. Yeah. Uh, what, how did you in that couple weeks span, was it just athleticism and grit and just doing it and watching the other guy or how did you get a better than the better the best person on the team uh just doing it I, yeah i mean there was no you're right there were, i didn't one of the one of the things in my life that kind of kept me uh you know kind of drove me towards running the club and stuff is i never really i never really had a pole vault coach mm. uh, in high school i had coaches in high school and college i had coaches that, that very much supported my efforts would uh, in high school would get me um, articles, books, mm -hmm. magazines, and kind of help me learn. And, and they didn't, they didn't step in and, and try to pretend they were a coach. They, mm -hmm. they, they were along the journey with me mm -hmm. of learning more about the event. And that, and I think that really helped out a ton, but that's where I kind of, I look at, um, you know, I look at kind of the kids in the area uh, where I've been in Terre Haute. And, and uh, uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, I did a little bit of volunteer coaching and, um, I, I'm like, man, I, I want to provide those opportunities mm. and help, help, you know, increase right. the, the knowledge base, keep kids safe. Right. Uh, and that's kind of what led to me doing a club all these years. Well, well don't, don't, don't jump ahead of me <laughs> yet. Uh, I, 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 went, I went down that path. It's all good. We're going to, we're going to catch along on that, catch up on that path. Uh, so you kept doing the pole vault, uh, went through high school and you're doing it in high school. You also, there's a, and this, this always does fascinate me with you and your family you have a uh, fairly extensive background in swimming and diving as well, right? So was that, did you do both pole vaulting and swimming and diving in high school? Well, as you alluded to, I was a pretty good cross country runner as well. Yeah. So uh, my, my three sports, I was cross country, uh, diving and pole vaulting. Right. Uh, in, in high school in particular, I wasn't a very good student. Mm. I, I had, I struggled quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of those guys that, uh, you know, if you go back to the report cards and the teacher would always write like a note, mm -hmm. I always got the, uh, he's really intelligent if he could just apply himself. You know, like, <laughs> oh, the, the old apply right yourself. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, I, I was, I made it to state in diving, uh, uh, as a sophomore, uh, I did not go as a junior because I had a quote attitude problem because I could that's a whole other story. Uh, and then my senior year, I had actually uh, in early season competitions because swimming and diving kind of bridges first semester, second semester. Mm. I had beaten the some of the top divers in the state in some meets, but then I my grades slipped and mm. I was ineligible. Mm. Uh, and the guy that the guys that got first and second, I had beaten in early season competitions. Um, and we're talking about Indiana, which I think is a fairly like top five state for high school swimming and diving. Well, I, I mean, I mean, outside, you know, I assume California and Texas just because of volume, but I always thought Indiana was a pretty, they have really good swim programs for sure. Yeah, okay. I, the diving, I could, I'd have to default to my sister to yeah. know for sure. 
because I think the other thing you're kind of getting at is, is, you know, I have a nephew that's one of the top divers in the nation. Yeah. Uh, he's currently dives for the University of Miami, uh, competed in his first Olympic trials. At the age of like Young. Yeah. Which isn't crazy. uncommon for divers, but mm. it, it, it kind of is. Okay. But, um, you know, so, so he became a, a he, he is a very good, uh, very good diver. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the story I got from my sister was he had kind of, he had seen like photos of me or something that made him go, what's that? That looks kind of cool. But now he, I only jumped off of a little thing that was one meter off the ground. Of course it was springy. Right. Uh, and he's. Is he one of the like platforms? Platform oh guys. man. Yeah. I, I've never been up there because I don't think it would not end well. I'm certainly not going off the thing, but it, like, I don't know that the ladder is allowed to go back down. That's how I would have to get off that thing. You can go back. Yeah, well, that's well. First of all, I'm not going up it, so it doesn't we, matter. We did a, we did yeah. a tour of uh, the IPY <clears throat> natatorium where mm. uh, my my nephew was training at, and they allowed you to go up just to look off, and then you can go back down. Dude, how scary! I mean, it's so, ten meters. I mean, it, it's up there. Yeah, that's like our tallest hammer cage for crying out loud. Put it in perspective, right? I don't want to be on the top of our hammer cage and then jump off of it. By the way. No way, not happening. So how was, uh, through high school, how was pole vaulting going? You said you didn't really have a pole vault coach, specific coach. Uh, were you still getting better and achieving some success in that? I, I mean, basically, I improved about a foot a year hmm. uh, as I came up through, you know, footer a little more. And, um, you know, my, I made the state my sophomore year, my junior year. Uh, I was not allowed to compete because my junior year I had a, I had some pretty... Uh, do you want to share so with us this attitude so problem you had? Uh, issues in my junior year, and, and the track coach also uh, made the decision that that he wasn't going to let me compete in the sectionals. Okay. And, uh, so I couldn't do anything. And then I'm, the following year, um, myself and and uh, two other two other guys across the state, one from a little south and one from up north, uh, uh, we took first, second, and third. Jump, you know, I got third wow. uh, misses and. Uh, went on to get my first 16 foot jump the week after the state meet, which wow. would have won it, I think. Oh. Uh, but yeah, so so it just kept it. You know, they they you always hear the stories about athletics kind of keeping people on the right path. Mm. Um, I I could honestly say I probably the only reason I I kept my grades up was so that I could do sports. Interesting, you know, yeah. But, you hear that? And although yeah. I did have struggles, but though I think those struggles my junior year is what kind of taught me that you know. I really miss being able to mm. be on the teams and when someone was taken away from you the teams is doing a little bit better in the classroom. Right. So I started doing better in the classroom. So you, you were essentially you were a 16 foot jumper in high school. We'll say 15, six. Yeah. Okay. See, I would just round up. Um, what was this on bamboo or I steel? Like a javelin back then. I just round up. What was this on bamboo or steel? Cause it's been, you know, this was back in your high school day. So 1930. Yeah. That's yeah. Not, that's not <laughs> Uh, so obviously, but we are talking about, this is the eighties cause I graduated 94. So eighties, um, a 16 footer was at least recruitable for colleges and stuff sure. like that. What, what was the next step after high school? Um, you know, again, I, I think I had a, 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 I've told you this story before, but I've, I've had a kind of a moment of clarity. Uh, I pretty much knew as a, a, between my junior and senior year, you know, when everybody's looking at colleges, um, I kind of recognized that you know i wasn't ready to go to college mm. like a, i had a uh, i don't know how a uh, a young you know barely getting by high school kid realizes can i i had the the ability to see into the future and go if i go to college i'm never going to make it and i'm going to end up working at a gas station mm. no offense to people that work at gas stations mm-hmm. but that wasn't where i wanted to be All right um so I actually chose to uh, join the military. Uh, hmm. I, you know, career fair day, went and talked to the army recruiter um, and uh, set up an appointment to, to go see him. Uh, my mom dead set against this. She, Is that right? Ooh, yeah. My dad, yeah, he probably should go. <laughs> yeah. um, so so I, the, uh, I go to the recruiting office and, and I get ready to walk in to see the, the army recruiter. I was a little early. Uh, and, uh, there's this Marine in his dress blues leaning against his door out in the hallway. And that's as I in the in, army. The, the, most of the time, the recruiting offices are all oh, okay, in the okay. same building. So you're about to walk in the army. He's hanging so out in the Marine. The yeah. And okay. so there's this Marine standing out in the doorway. And uh, I walked by and he's like, 
so you think you're going to join the army, huh? And I was like, whoa, yeah. And he was like, real men join the Marines. And he turns around and walks into his office. Of course, the, you know, the, 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 the sports, the, the athletes. Competitiveness. Like, what? Wait, what? I turn around and I ended up at, in his office and, and missing the army. That's office. how you joined the Marines. The Marine Corps was a, a chance encounter with a, a very good recruiter <laughs> uh, standing out, plucking. Wow. Uh, kids getting ready to go. Yeah, to he was just army. waiting for people yeah, to show up to the army. I yeah. To be that one. So you literally walked, you, you were behind him and you, like, what did you say to him? Like when you, uh, you know, I, yeah, just, I, that one. But was, that's the day you signed uh, or at least decided. I couldn't sign. I wasn't old. Oh, okay. So this had to be, uh, but it, it definitely, I changed my, wow. my, my branch from army to Marine Corps be, be, because of that. That's, and, uh, I think there's a story there for people who are recruiting track athletes, hang outside the football and be like, well, you know, and wait for the real men and women that we run track. Crazy pole vault. <laughs> um, so so that so in order to actually go, go into the military, my mom had to sign the paperwork. Oh, and she was wasn't young, really kosher was, about this. I was a young student athlete. And, uh, there were probably a few teardrops on that sheet of paper that she, Aww, that she signed. So, yeah. yeah. So what's it like? being in the Marines, like, you know, we, we talk about, you're never a former Marine. You are a retired Marine, right? Is that how you're supposed to say, but you're always a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Once a Marine, I, always a Marine. I always kind of reserve the, the retired, uh, that, that, that has, that indicates that you spent your 20 years, you, mm. did, you did a full, Gotcha. Uh, I was only in for about five years. Well, well don't minimize it. Only five years. I mean, that's, but you know, once that's 10 years more than me. Cause you know, I'd be negative five. I couldn't do it, man. <laughs> uh, they chew me up in the Marine, you know, this, come on now, this is, that's not a secret. So what, what was it like? Like, where did you go for training? What was your job in the Marines? Uh, well, uh, you know, they, they always talk about where'd you go to boot camp? I'm mm-hmm. a Hollywood Marine. Uh, to this day, the smell of jet fuel reminds me of boot camp. You said Hollywood Marine. It, uh, the Marine Corps has two training places where they train uh, incoming Marines and that's for enlisted and that's in, in San Diego and Paris Island. Okay. So Hollywood, so San Diego. Hollywood, San Diego. Yeah. Diego okay. Diego, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the, the Marine Corps base uh, is where they you know, do this training is right. There's a gate next to the airport, San Diego airport. Okay. So the smell of jet fuel. Oh yeah. In the yeah, mornings, yeah. You go out for your run, you smell jet fuel. You, right. you smell jet fuel. everything you smell jet fuel huh uh, so, so that brings up that memory yeah so if oh, I, that's if interesting I, you know when i fly these days if i get out near a yeah you smell the jet fuel it just reminds me of boot camp wow um so when i graduated i, I graduated boot camp i went back home um and uh my my first training duty station i, I went in open contract that just means do what you i want. don't know what i want to do just yeah. assign me to something okay and, and uh uh, usually you end up being a, a grunt, uh, you know, just a ground pounding, mm-hmm. you know, nothing, no, um, you know, you're not, you're not like driving tanks or working on planes. Uh, I actually ended up being a field radio operator, which is the, the grunt that you basically have a target on your back. You want. You're the, the, like the you phone on the back? Out, yeah. 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 Take that guy out. He can't communicate with anybody. That all, means all those guys there can't talk to anybody. All my knowledge <laughs> comes from Saving Private Ryan. Okay. Oh, oh, no, no. And, um, uh, no, no, yeah, that's a good one too. No, there was a movie. My so my brother went into the army. He, he did not have that great marine recruiter. So um, before the summer, before he was you know going, we watched. Um, no, what's the one with um, Gomer Pyle? Uh, Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket. We watched that I know, literally. I had the best scene in my head but, every day yeah. for the whole summer. So that's all my knowledge of Marines. Is is that how, how accurate is that? Because that was boot camp for them. How accurate was that for you? Did, was there a guy in your face twenty four seven? I mean, you know, they condense movies into these. It's, scenes, it's Hollywood. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. You still went to sleep. You still yeah. woke up really early. You, you know, so there's. Did they beat you with soaps and a sock? I remember that scene. Uh, not me personally. Okay. No. All right. All right. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I mean, everything has a little bit. Of, everything in those movies, they try to have a little bit of truth. To okay. Them, but uh, you know, the the idea of a blanket party, right? Which is, yeah. You know, I, I had heard rumors of it. I don't know that it ever happened. Yeah. I, I never was personally aware of it. Right. So that's a little. 
Yeah. You know, you're a little, a little crazy. I, full metal wow. jacket, man. Watched it every day. It made me look crazy. <laughs> so where, where were some places that you were stationed and some of the things that you did in, in the Marines? Well, you know, so, so I went to 29, Palm, 29 Palms, California was my first training duty station. That sounds really nice. Uh, I'm trying to remember the general, one of the, I think it was Patton. General Patton called 29 Palms, California, the butthole of, a, <laughs> of, the, of the world or something Really? Like that, 29 was, Palms? That sounds like a boutique hotel. Uh, it's the, certainly not the uh, album cover of U2. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Yucca Tree, uh, the past Yucca, California. Um, it, it's one of those places where you wake up in the morning and it's it, there's you know, a half inch of snow on the ground. Oh. It's, it's cold and... and and by 10 o'clock, it's 82 degrees. Oh, so okay. California, baby. It's high desert. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's rough. But um, so I did comm school there. But I, I discovered while I was at comm school that the military, the Marine Corps, had a track team. And I was like, they have a track team? I wonder if they have a pole vaulter. Of course, they don't have the internet back then. So I'm, right. I'm asking and I'm asking. And they're like, well, you can't request to go try out for anything until you get to your, your first duty station. You're mm. still in school. You haven't been assigned anywhere. Mm. So I'm in California. I graduate. My first duty station is Quantico, Virginia. Oh, yeah. So I fly all the way across the country, get there. Uh, luckily, I was with, uh, stationed at OCS, the Officer Candidate School there mm -hmm. um, at Quantico. And uh, I go to, I get assigned to uh, a maintenance department. Like, they, everything else was full. It was the, the summer. They didn't have a lot of, of candidates in. Or it was the summer. Anyway, they didn't have a lot of candidates on, on going through at the time. So they... They didn't need a, a lot of personnel. So I get assigned to uh, this maintenance department, mowing lawns, mm -hmm. uh, fixing stuff. Surprise. Right? Man. Um, so I go to my commanding officer and uh, I, I, I'm like, hey, I heard about this track team thing and I heard the tryouts are coming up. It, is that something I could do? I was a pole vaulter in high school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, my, my gunny really championed it like he didn't know me he'd, well, he'd known me for like a week what's a gunny is that like your he was in charge of me he was the first manager the guy that like in my department who i went to he was my boss okay there were certainly people above him well we know chain of command so that's your first, my first range my yeah mm -hmm. and uh he you know didn't know me from adam and uh he said let's go see and uh sure enough a week later so i fly i fly to Quantico, Virginia. All right. From California. Um, time changed. Yeah. Delirious. A week later, I fly back to California because uh, the, the the training facility was uh, uh, El Toro, an Air Force or a, a air base, a Marine Corps air base huh. uh, in, in California. And uh, I, I didn't know if it was day, night, at the time. <laughs> I just remember being very disoriented down there. <laughs> They, it, the funny thing is, you know, we always hear about um, equipment problems. You know, people don't have poles. Mm -hmm. Big deal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, same, same thing. I had to call my dad. He shipped me out some poles that he had bought wow. over the years. And uh, so I could have poles I trained. And then where they trained was wherever they could get in at. Mm. So I had trained at uh, the Redlands for a while. I trained at um, UC Irvine for a little while. I trained, you know, there was, who knows? I don't remember all the tracks. All right. And uh, then they would just enter competitions out in California, um, the hmm. old LA relays. I got to yeah. I got to jump in in one of I don't remember what year those ended, but I got to jump in an LA relays when they were still kind of a big deal. So. Now you know consistency matters in any event, right? Uh, pole vault maybe more so. Were you able to get consistent training, like, or was this just like a once a week? Like, how did you actually do? the marine job but then also vault well you don't you, you uh, uh you're you're on ta leave stands for temporary additional duty so at that point we still had you know a morning formation we all had to come out our our uniform of the day mm. uh was shorts and a t-shirt and you know we'd eat our breakfast and we'd go to the track and and uh work out and it's kind of my first uh uh my first experience in writing workouts because they yeah, had no coach. coach. Right. We yeah. Training. Right. You know, that, I wrote my own workouts. I went out and vaulted all by myself. Were there some good athletes? I, yeah. I mean, they are all athletic, but like, were they, you know, so, so that year I, I, we competed.
competed in enough meets. I, there were no other Marine Corps pole vaulters, and, and the way the their, the season wraps up is is you go compete in that in, in an inter service meet, hmm. and uh, uh, in that inter service meet, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, you all compete against each other, and then That's cool. that they select um, a what's called a SISM team, it's Council of International Sports in the Military, and they kind of have a military Olympics, hmm. <clears throat> and. Uh, I made the uh, I made the pole vault squad, so I made the SISM team, which was kind of cool. Uh, Very. The SISM championships were over in Germany that year. I never oh, the country, so it's a big deal. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, and I and I would be okay. I'll I'll, I'll admit to this because there's going to be people who are going to watch this and know who this is. But um, when I got to Gill many 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 years later, uh, I was talking to one of our dealers, hmm. and uh, uh, this this. Marine Corps kind of background thing came up and, and the, the meet and um, I discovered that I I had competed against one of our dealers back in the day and he had beat me I mm-hmm. didn't know I did mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, you know I'll, I'll say this for Eddie C so I got beat at by Eddie it's C. The, C. the only competition I've ever competed against only thing I like Eddie C's for <laughs> Is that he beat you? Yeah. Now you had so, to know height for him to win. But, I, I didn't yeah. know height, but hey, yeah. that's part of it. That's a win. That's right. His name was above yours in yep. the stat sheets. That's right. So, what else in the Marine and uh, what led you? You said you did five years. What led you to get out and continue well, moving on your career? Um, it, you know, again, there's, there's the weird things that you do when, I, when we're young. So, you know, I, I did my four years. I kind of knew that, that I had, I had gotten out of the military at that point what i what i wanted i was mm. more mature i was ready to go to go to college and i wasn't sure that i wanted the the military life was mm. like the path that i was i wanted to pursue mm-hmm. i always knew it would be there if like when you're younger you always fall back on mm. or go back in but and i if i go to college i can go back in and, and go through ocs i knew what it was about Work right. in the place i saw it happen uh and i could go back in and be an officer uh so when your when your time is up, you go talk to a few different people, and they try to convince you to stay in. At the time, they were mm-hmm. offering like reenlistment bonuses mm-hmm. in the you know ten thousand dollar reenlistment bonus, mm-hmm. and, you know, so you didn't get paid a lot, but to stay, they would give you these these incentives to stay. Right. Well, our commanding officer at OCS had changed, um, and the the you know the Congressional Medal of Honor is a, a, a very rare award, uh, and to be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor and still be, at, be active in the military is, is even more rare. Our um, the commanding officer at, at Officer Candidate School was a gentleman, Wesley Fox. And, and so he was one of the uh, maybe two or three uh, CMH holders that were still actually in the military. Mm. He was my commanding officer. Oh, wow. So now this, this looked like a movie to me. I, I went into his office. He's one of those guys, like he was a, you know, a Marine's Marine. He, mm. Cammy's, you know, didn't have the creases in him. And mm-hmm. so I don't know that he knew what starch was necessarily. And this is how I remember it. All right, right. Anyway, so I walk in and, and you know, he's got a cigar burning in the office. Well, he, has he is literally kicked back in his chair with his boots up on the table. And, and you know, of course, I have to do all the, uh, the form- formalities right. of, of, you know, walking in, standing at attention, you know. Uh, and he's just like, relax, Marine. I'm like, okay. And he's like, so what do I have to do? to get you to stay in my Marine Corps. And I was like, uh, you know, sir, I, I, you know, I know that I've already talked about the enlistment bonuses and, and everything and, and they offer promotions so that mm. if you stay in, you'll, you'll immediately be in a little bit higher pay. Right. And, and I, I just said to him, I said, sir, I, I said, if you could offer me meritorious, meritorious promotion to commandant of the Marine Corps and I would probably still get out. I'm ready to go to college. Wow. He let out the biggest like laugh, just, <laughs> well, good luck, Marine. You're excused. And that was like my whole conversation. Wow. I, I just, I had made up my mind. Like, like I felt like I was being hounded mm. to try and reenlist. Well, it's hard to say no to a guy like that too, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah it was, yeah. it was, uh, he's an, he was a very intimidating right. man to, to hmm. be for sure. So. so you get out and you go to, you go straight to college or um yeah i I had well so i had reached out to several of the schools back in indiana that's where i wanted to go back to uh, Mm -hmm. back to i had family you know friends um and uh john mcnichols did Mm. an absolute um, amazing job of of sending me you know 
I didn't have email back then, sending me letters with, you know, telling me about how the team was doing with meet results, uh, checking in. Um, of course, I didn't have a cell phone. And back then, every, you know, the cool thing was to have a car phone, right? Oh, like, yeah. You didn't have one of those, did you? Oh, I was about to say. <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, I, I was, I kind of wanted to go to IU, but hmm. they, you know, they had some very, very good vaulters. I, I hadn't, you know, I, even though I jumped to maybe 15 and when I was in the Marine Corps, that's mm. still just, you know, coming into college, especially if you've already got a group of vaulters, you mm-hmm. need a 15 footer. So I kind of, Marshall had kind of encouraged me, you know, he did reach out and, and said, if I wanted to walk on, that would be great. Mm-hmm. And, and, but on the flip side, you know, my, my mom was a graduate of Indiana state. And oh, so I had gone yeah. back and, and uh, kind of visited and, and I, my grandmother lived in Sullivan, Indiana, which was mm-hmm. just out and been a camping and fishing at Sullivan Lake, you know, as a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so I just decided that was where I was going to go. And, and um, so I started off, I, I got in in first semester and, and took a few classes. And so, so you're like a 23 year old freshman, 22, 22. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I mean, cause that, you know, we talk about 18 year olds coming into college. Well, now here's a, a guy who, you know, been in the Marines, like it, it feels like you're getting something a little extra special with that freshman. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you know, there's, it, it just the way I did it. Yeah. I don't know that uh, uh, it, did I have a benefit from it? Probably as the, just the maturity. I was going to say four but, years of just physical maturity, but also mental. Uh, Social. I needed that to be a freshman in college. That, you know, <laughs> that brought you up to the eighteen-year-old uh, freshman level. <laughs> um, what, what did you go into major in? What was your thought process there? I, I always, you know, kind of my my thought process was I always wanted to, to be a teacher, and I always wanted mm. to go back to like the Greenwood area. I could see you that. Know, yeah, your old high school. Mm-hmm. I, I graduated from Center Grove. Right. Um, but uh, you know, life took me a different path. But I did. I, I went to. I started at Indiana State as a a freshman in, in education. Yeah. Um, I was going to do an emphasis on physical education. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be a coach. I mm-hmm. thought that was cool. Uh, I had gotten far enough, like, you know, if you if you take classes enough and then you try to quit, they don't give you your money back. <laughs> That's a thing. Know? Who knew? Uh, so so uh, uh, I went and I got a Western Union mail grant from the Marine Corps, cordially inviting me back for the Gulf War. When I say that, that's a, that's a joke. I, they didn't cordially invite me back. I had to go back. Is that right? Yeah. Um, wait, wait, wait. So you got out of the Marines. Mm-hmm. You enroll, almost said enlist. You enroll at Indiana State. Mm-hmm. And they, they yanked yeah, you back so, in. So when you join the military, you typically have a, so I did a four-year enlistment, but mm-hmm. a four-year enlistment means an eight-year obligation. So you do four years active duty, then you're, you're four years inactive duty. And what inactive duty is, is you just have to check in once a year and say, yeah. make sure your address and stuff are up to date. Because if they need you, they're going to call you back. Uh, once my eight years was up, then I was officially out. Right. Not that they still, it's the government. Right. They kind of grab you if you want. But right. you would be very, I would have been very low on the list. So after however many months I was in, in Indiana State, uh, my dad... <laughs> I uh, got the Western Union mail grant and he was scared he knew what it was about. So he, you literally have one week from the day you get it mm. to, to report to Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Well, he waited two or three days. He was nervous about, you know, he knew I was being called back in. From mm, he knew, yeah. But finally he knew he didn't want, he also didn't want me to be a traitor. All right, <laughs> so, sure. So he was- <laughs> Some he integrity called, there. He called and, uh, you know, I, I, got called back in and I had to go to the president of the university and explain to him that I had been called back in. Uh, it's past the, the refund deadline. Oh, I think you say it's past and, the week. And he just, yeah. he, it was short, sweet. Uh, I don't remember who the president was at the time, but he was just like, yeah, don't worry about it. Awesome. He goes, it took care of you. Nope. No problem at all. Good for Good luck. We hope you make it back. Yeah. Oh yeah, gosh. That, what a, you know, that's a tough statement to make. Cause well, it's true. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I kind of skipped over the whole, you know, finding my wife at Quantico part. Oh, wait, for all, real? <laughs> I didn't know that. Of that yeah. Of that history, but, um, so are you married at this time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, wow. No, actually, actually, I take that back. Let me think. What was that? 
Yeah, I was. Okay, so uh, so I met my wife my second year in the Marine, in the Marine Corps. For a second, she was. I met her at the drive-through at McDonald's uh, on the base. I used to get a lot of extra uh, Monopoly game pieces. <laughs> get a free fry, and I'd come back and I'd get it again. Uh, I think she liked me, so I get the you know. Um, and uh, you you know all about the uh, underside of the McDonald's Monopoly game, right? Oh yeah. Hey, if you don't know this, you've got to go. I think there's a Netflix documentary. Like the mob was involved uh, money laundering through the McDonald's monopoly game. Really? Yeah. Tremendous. Yeah. Like, like legit, not like uh conspiracy theory here. Like, you know, no, there's people convicted. No wonder I never won anything more than like a free fry. No one did. Yeah. Cause it was all <laughs> set up for this one person in, you know, Queens or whatever. I don't know where the mob or, you know, hangs out, but yeah, yeah, no, it's legit. Legit. Sorry. I just, no. when you mentioned that, I was like, do you know, uh, so, yeah, so we, we dated for a couple of years and we got, I got out of the Marine Corps. We got married. I drug her to Terre Haute. We're, we're, she's not from Indianapolis area? Uh, she, her, she's a military brat. Mm. Uh, she lived her life kind of on military basis. Okay. So, so now she's, uh, I get called back in. She's yeah. all by herself oh. in Terre Haute. In Terre Haute. <laughs> uh, you know, working a job, literally knows nobody. I'll say, you're right. Yeah, no friends, off, no family. I'm back off to California where they, you know, we got in processed again. I didn't actually uh, get called over, you know, I, because I got called back in, I'm a Gulf War veteran. Okay. I, I didn't see any that okay. action, so to speak. Yeah. So, cause it, it was during kind of the, um, they were ramping things down a little bit. Okay. Like it, it you can't usually turn things on a dime like that. Right, so, right, right. So right. I got in, I just got to spend some time out in California, play a little beach volleyball uh, <laughs> in Riverside and, and uh, have a couple of beers with, with guys and stuff. And, um, I got back out and came home. So how long was how long was that? Oh, no more than maybe six months or so. Wow, that's so why I said it's four and a half years I was in. Or so yeah, I got it, got uh, it. Because I there's also that time that I was out. So mm -hmm. from the time I joined until the time I got out, the second time might be five years. Right. Yeah. So you go back to Terre Haute and go back to school. Go back to, school. Go back to vaulting. Yeah. So who, who was your vault coach? Was was it Johnny Mac? Yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, he was writing the workouts when I first got there. Yeah. Um, he he was going through a little bit of a tough time uh, when I got back. So the the first time enrolled, I, I would have had some teammates in the in the event. Uh, but then when I got called back in and I came back, I was basically me and and maybe one other guy mm -hmm. just walking on. And what had happened was he had. Uh, uh, one guy decided he didn't want to be in college anymore, so he went to truck driver school. Mm. Uh, one of the better kids had a, a motorcycle accident and was killed. Oh, jeez. Uh, uh, so John, John kind of at the time, I, you know, I learned later, you know, later on, you know, I was with Indiana State's program for 10 years mm -hmm. or more. Um, he, he was a little bit like the event. He was a little soured on the event, mm. because, not because of the event, but because of these all these things His that have said all of this thing mm -hmm. that happened. Mm -hmm. And so when I came in, he was kind of giving me workouts and uh, I, I kind of, because I'd already gone and been training and, and I coached a little bit there in Manassas, uh, Virginia, when I was in the Marine Corps. And mm -hmm. uh, I kind of started talking to him a little bit about, about helping out and writing the workouts. Mm -hmm. He, you know, obviously John, you know, was one of the best hurdle coaches without a doubt in NCAA history. Uh, and I couldn't run hurdles. If we established that. Just keep those <laughs> things away from me. And so a lot of his workouts revolved around, you know, and, and I know hurdles is good for good for steps, good for mm -hmm. speed, good for, you know, they're, they're, it's good for a lot of other events, but I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so he and I sat down and, you know, obviously I'm, I'm 22, I'm not 18 and, mm -hmm. and I'd written some workouts, didn't really know what the heck I was doing. Right. So he just really helped me out in, in um, making what I, in learning to to write workouts a little better, to, mm. to make them more specific, to make and, and to, to kind of develop and, and progress. And, you know, so I, I, you know, he's just a, an amazing mentor of mine. Um, and John Gartland, of course, mm. uh, being a, a reservist at the time, he and I oh, got along really know that. well. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, mean, I still talk to Gartland to this day. Did you go back and study PE uh, education when you came back as well? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, my degree is teaching K through twelve, uh, with with an emphasis on on physical education, but I never took the NTE. So I, that was the path you were yeah. 
going to coach, be a teacher sure. and coach and yeah. And the high school level. And yeah. Yeah. But uh, when I got out and when I graduated, actually before I graduated, I started, uh, you know, I kept training, uh, involving and, and um, pursued kind of co a coaching career. And mm -hmm. it, that's why I never took the NTE. I coached at Indiana State. I coached. Uh, what, what's the NTE? The National Teacher's Exam. Oh, okay. That would you have to pass to become yeah. a teacher? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Standardized, kind of another standardized test. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, uh, I was doing a good job at Indiana State. They, uh, I ended up getting a job in the department and and still uh, coaching. Uh, I ended up to start my graduate work up at Central Michigan with uh, Coach Jim Knapp, so another oh, amazing yeah. coach, uh, amazing guy. I learned more about uh, dealing with personalities with him in the year that I was there than I really did kind of with John. Huh. Uh, I, with John, I think I, I made him a better person with challenging personalities, <laughs> where I think Jim had a lot of challenging personalities on his team, and, and he was able to kind of help me understand things a little better. Uh, for those that knew John, uh, he, he had this this vein in his forehead <laughs> that if you got under him his skin just right that it, it, he he wasn't an angry person right but that was kind of a telltale sign sometimes <laughs> and, and i saw it frequently <laughs> uh, student athlete. and as a coach occasionally <laughs> if you're not at button heads with your your head coach every once in a while you're probably not you know proving yourself necessarily. that's right that's right so you went from Indiana State to Central Michigan, and then uh, then uh, yeah, and then John called me and, and said, "Hey, I want you to come back." Okay. <laughs> so he, uh, we, my wife and I, we had a you know I had a son uh, mm -hmm. while I was in school, and and you know leaving Terre Haute was really tough. Uh, we were starting to settle up, settle in, and, and Mount Pleasant. And, but then when when uh, John called back, like I had a really good, good group of athletes, uh, had gotten a vaulter uh, uh, to indoor nationals, had a mm -hmm. uh, a really good triple jumper, uh, a guy from Ghana, Africa that I was working with. He he transferred, so it, it really my leaving didn't change any of that. Mm -hmm. um, but when I when I got the offer, I went back. I went home to Lori and I, I said, "Hey, uh, so you want to go back to Terre Haute or not?" And at that time, we were both kind of, you know, we're here. We're you know, I hadn't finished a, I hadn't finished my degree. I was I was pursuing my master's in, in coaching. Mm. Um, and so I said, okay, look, I'm going to write down on a piece of paper out of a hundred percent, how much I want to go back to Terre Haute versus mm -hmm. how much I want to stay here. Okay. You know, so if you're, but we have to agree, you know, like you can't go 50, 50. Mm -hmm. I wrote 50, 50. She <laughs> wrote 51% to go back to Terre Haute. <laughs> it, it was literally that, that close to wow. just, uh, central. Uh, and we went back and, and, uh, started coaching there again and I was so sick of going to school at that point I, I went to John mm. and I, I am I've been in been taking classes now for that would have been going on seven years right I, just like, I am so sick of being a student I do not I need a break right so I uh I was gonna take a semester off I'm still taking those semesters <laughs> off. it keeps day, extending <laughs> uh, you're you know, in your so, 20 something so year I never, never finished my master's uh and, uh but John worked with me. He, he made the position, you know, kind of a stipend position mm. versus uh, uh, for the GA, and, and that was where I had the I worked in the athletic department. Yeah. So, it, um, so because where where does it fit in where you come to Gill? You were at Indiana State. Well, okay, I thought. so Terre Haute's not that far from here. All right. right, hour and a half. All right. Uh, as you well know from being in sales, when someone wants a new pole, they want it yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I would drive over, you mm. know, I would pick up equipment, I would pick up right. poles. So I would drive over after class, be back in time for practice, have right. that brand new pole out, jump right. on it that evening. Uh, so uh, uh, that was how I got to know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, know Gill Athletics. I, I really, it was Fred Dixon. Mm -hmm. So again, I've been so lucky the people I've got, gotten to, uh, to meet and, and establish relationships with in my life. It, mm -hmm. It's all... I guess you could call it dumb luck. Yeah. It's it's uh there's a plan in there somewhere. Yeah. But um, you know, I got to know Fred. Uh, the Gill had created a new. Uh, it was kind of when they were first starting to pursue some some technical sales reps, people mm. who, who had a little more knowledge uh, in individual events. And I came over to 
uh, pick up a pole, and I and I had just gotten a, I have a tattoo. I have a pacer carbon tattoo. There was no way this was gonna so, so go two, on without you talking about this tattoo. Two, you know, I, I believe that if you have a tattoo, it should be something that's that's unbelievably important in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, such a part of you. And and I have a Marine Corps tattoo, and I have a pacer carbon tattoo. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. pole vaulting. And, and, and where does where where is my face and name tattooed? Like you said, things that are very important to you. So vaulting, the pacer, the Marine Corps, and then. Uh, we have to keep this clean. So okay. All right. Well, that's, that's fair. That's fair. I did kind of. Several of the comments just popped into my As head. I said it, I was like, well, I'm really softballing this one up to a bad so, place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's skip that then. So you're, you're getting to know Fred because you're coming over to, to yeah, so, uh, pick so, up poles. So they had, they had come up with this position. And, and uh, so I came and picked up a pole, showed Fred my tattoo. And, and we, were, we were just talking and. And so I get back in the car, drive home. And it, I was an assistant coach at the time. So I get back to my office and uh, I got a voicemail and it's Fred. And he was like, uh, he was like, oh my gosh, Brian, you're sometimes the most obvious people are the last people you think of. We have this new position uh, uh, for tech sales. Uh, you know, we want somebody that has, has knowledge in, in specific event areas. And obviously, you know, pole vault would be uh, right up your alley. Now, mind you, Fred was doing all the pole vault questions at the time. So mm -hmm. this was a little self-serving for him as well. But. Now, he big time pole vaulter, two-time Olympic decathlete. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, he's also the most humble guy you'll ever meet in your life. Uh, when it comes to pole vaulting, maybe not. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I kind of quietly listened to the message and, and he asked if I want to come interview. And I, I call him immediately and I say, hey, and obviously that's a big step. Let me, uh, you know, how, how long before I have to give you an answer if I want to come interview? And he's like, I'll give you the end of the week. And I think that was just like a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So I go home. Cause this was out of left field. Like you're a coach. Oh yeah. You're like not, I, you're not I in the private looking, sector. I wasn't looking for yeah. anything. Right. I wasn't, I didn't have a, a resume out. Right. I wasn't, you know, uh, actually I didn't even have a resume out for assistant coaching positions, which is really uncommon because every coach at every level, keep it up. Their resume mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, so, uh, talk to the wife and I was like well I'll it I think I know what it's about Let, I, I'll at least go interview and uh, so I went over and, and did the interview and it, that was probably of, of all of the, the decisions I made in my life like whether to go up and start my grad work at, at Central whether to leave Central to uh, whether to join the Marine Corps with you know mm -hmm. this was by far the most difficult decision I ever made it's you know anybody that's ever mm -hmm. left coaching by their own choice, um, it, it's just the kids. It's so hard to, to look right. at this group of kids who, who kind of chosen to, to come train with you, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. They believed um, in you in the yeah, school. And, and, yeah. and mm -hmm. you, you kind of walk away. And I, and I know there are some people that do it much easier than others, but I, it was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, so the, the only thing that really made it doable was I called uh, Tom Doyle. Gary Winicky, yeah, uh, and said, "Hey, if I take this job at Gill, I would really love to still be involved in in coaching a little bit." And, and Tom, I think Tom may have even cut me off mid sentence and goes, "You can have the Balters, right? The workouts, wow, just do everything. It's, they're yours." And I was like, "Ah, oh, okay." So really, that if that opportunity hadn't been there, I probably wouldn't have taken the job. That kind of made it feel better. Like, okay, I may be getting out of full-time coaching, but I'm still I, I able to, to coach. In my mind, it was, I still had my toe in the water, mm, right? Mm -hmm. Like I kind of got one foot over here, right. but if this doesn't work out, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. this is, I'm still keeping my, my face in the game, so to speak. Right. You know, so. So you come to Gill. Now we've talked about what you do and have done at Gill, which uh, we probably actually didn't do it very much justice. Knowing, you know, having worked with you for 15 years, you've done so much more uh, than some of the things we talked about. But let's talk about, so you're at Gill, but you've, you have done and are doing amazing things concurrently at the same time. So you are the owner and creator, uh, CEO, CFO, uh, janitor, uh, equipment manager of I'm everything but the CFO. Oh, that's Lori. Yeah. 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 Okay. CFO. That's, CFO. that makes so much. <laughs> See, you are smart because you make her the CFO. Very good. Uh, of a club. And it's, it probably nowadays is not fair to call it a pole vault club, right? Uh, it started out as a pole vault club, PV junkies, 
Right. So when did you start that and, and why? Why in the world does someone start a pole vault club? Well, the, it's, it's funny because it kind of goes back to that uh, wanting to give back kind of mm. uh, thing. That, so one of the guys I got to know pretty well and we were pretty good friends for a really long time. We, I won't say we're estranged. We just haven't talked much lately. Uh, a guy by the name of Dwayne Brode. Um, I competed against him at state meet. Mm. Uh, he chose to go to Indiana University when I went to Marine Corps. But then when, when I got out of the Marine Corps and I was in Indiana State, we, we kind of teamed up and we started doing these little pole vault camps. Mm. And uh, he would he would kind of do all the paperwork side of things. And of course, I was the man to labor, right? <laughs> I would make sure the pits were set up and, and do the coaching and stuff. So so we, we ran Hoosier pole vault camps uh, at lots of different places. Uh, still doing the state fair vault. You know, he would he and I just kind of did all these, these special little pole vault things. Uh, he was even offering like private lessons and stuff in the Indianapolis area for a long time. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how it started. Mm -hmm. and, and I took that. And when I was still training at Indiana state, I was going out, you know, I would run my practice, coach the athletes, and then I would train. I'd be out there all by myself. Mm -hmm. And I'd have people like, give me a call and say, Hey, uh, can I just come jump with you? And I'm like, I'm kind of lonely mm -hmm. by myself out here. Sure. And so the, like I started having these, these, uh, high school kids. And so it, I kind of heard about a club, like clubs mm -hmm. weren't very formalized. Back yeah, then. I was gonna say, when did you start? When, when was this? Cause you got here around two in the 90s. thousand. Like in the, Oh, this the is still over there. 90s, right, right, right. Like okay. Yeah, that's right. You're just telling uh, so I've got, you know, uh, I had one kid in particular that, that, you know, kind of his, I, I really started coaching um, the one kid. Like, so we, Indiana state had pole vault camps. Mark Hollis mm. has, has sent me a photo of him at one of the Indiana state pole vault camps. Oh, wow. Mark. It was kind of, oh, that's kind of cool. fun to see. I wish I could find that photo. I don't know he's got it, but I, I that's he cool. me to have it to share. <laughs> um, but uh, there was a, a young man by the name of Josh Despenet. And uh, Josh was a, a very talented athlete. His dad, he kind of jumped his age to about, I know, 10 years old for sure. <laughs> it might have been longer. Um, but his dad kind of came to me uh, after a little while and said, hey, uh, I, can you help me out? I'm, he's kind of, you know, I don't know what way to go. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, can you help me get him to the next level and go? And, you know, over the next two or three years, uh, uh, Josh jumped 17 plus. He was the number one high school kid in the nation. Wow. And, you know, so that, that was where I kind of realized, like, I could help some kids out. Mm -hmm. and, and so we started having these little, I treated it more like training groups than mm -hmm. I did a club. Right. Because, you know, like, well, like he's the a way club. I run it now, I, I coach kids. I sit on, I sit over in a chair and I'm telling them what to do, right? I coach right. them. Uh, where what I was doing then was I was writing my workouts and these kids were coming from training with me and mm -hmm. we were vaulting together. So, well, like he said, you know, pole vault clubs were not what they are today no. back then. I mean, it, it's, you know, Pole vault clubs, have, it's its own industry yeah. at this Pole vault clubs back then were the local high school coach running a club so he could train his kids on the side. <laughs> right, right. So right. That, was, that was pretty much what the pole vault. So, so how did you come up with the name them. PV Junkies? Um, well, uh, I had, um, I had, a, I had a, a, something happen in my life that, that, you know, had me reflect, you know, we've all made mistakes in our lives and uh, mm -hmm. I had to go through some counseling where, uh, they talked about addiction mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, I got a DUI when I was old, much younger. Uh, and part of the, uh, the training that we went through, they talked about different levels of addiction. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking about, I, I didn't, I, I, I was in a bad situation. I had gone out. I decided not to drive that night. I slept in my car. I woke up the next morning, uh, felt good, you know, kind of thought I made the right decision. Mm -hmm. So I, so I drove back to, uh, to where I was living at at the time. And on my way back, I got pulled over. Well, mm -hmm. I hadn't waited long enough. Mm -hmm. So I got the DUI right. and, uh, I'm not making an excuse for it, but I, I like to say, I, I think I tried to do the right, right. thing right. and not drive that night, but it still caught up with me. So we're, we're getting these, these levels of addiction and it, the, the counselor says, uh, is there anything else in your life that you could apply this to? And I'm thinking to myself, well, with alcohol, I'm not, you know, I'm not like full-fledged addicted in this tier system. I, I could probably drink less, 
I, we can all say that at, at given times. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, but, but dear Lord, I am 100, I'm over the top addicted to pole vaulting. Wow. Like, do you do, you know, do you miss things? Do you do this? Do you, I'm like, I, yes. Right. Yes. And, and uh, so it was uh, kind of like, man, I need to do something with this. Hmm. So that. So junky. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that obviously has so a connotation. When I, when I'm yeah. thinking, you know, going back, um, I became pole vault junkie. Yeah. Like that, that I would, junkie is a, a harsh term. I've, I've had people, uh, um, come, you know, express their concern about the club sure. name or, and I'm like, you, you just like, I get it. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and recently I've thought about it because you're right. I do. I have, Pole wall, I have high jump, mm -hmm. I have the throws, and mm -hmm. I've got, uh, I, we do some sprints and hurdles in, in the club now. And I'm, I've mm. actually been in some serious talks in the past two weeks about putting a long jump and triple jump pit in. Mm. Um, so I've been thinking, is it time to change the club name? But I, I really, you know, as much the few people who've given me a hard time about it, I've just resisted to say, like, my first email address is PB Junkie at Hot. <laughs> right. Like, right. I, this goes back, I don't even know when Hotmail was created, but I bet it was like 10 minutes after they started it. <laughs> and I, right. just, I just kept that. And so yeah. it's like, that's just kind of been my thing. And I might, you know, maybe it's not for me to be PB junkie again and not a club. I don't know. We'll get there. We'll yeah. see. Uh, what are the challenges of, of doing a, and again, it's not a pole vault club, even though pole vault may be the, the passion, of course, but what are some of the challenges with kids and um, schools and, and how you navigate all of that with, with a, a USATF, uh, assume it's USATF or yes. AAU yeah, uh, club. How, what are some of the challenges you face with that? Well, you know, probably the, the, the biggest challenge is, is the, uh, the club in Illinois in particular, there's, there's been some, some tension between like high school coaches and the club coaches. Uh, uh, Club coaches have been caught telling kids to skip their high school practice mm -hmm. to come train with them. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the kids seen at the local college running and you know, mm -hmm. the high school brings it. So the, the, there's, a, there's a little bit of an animosity there that I, I try to be upfront with all the coaches. Like, look, I get that you know, when these kids are in your season, I'm helping them become better for you. Mm -hmm. I hope that they then also choose to become a part of my club and participate in the USATF events in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, but don't, you know, call me, ask questions. What I'm, I'm helping you. Mm -hmm. you know, they're coming to me to get better, to perform. Like it's your season, not mm -hmm. mine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's probably, you know, I think I've, I've been doing this long enough that all the coaches know that now. Mm -hmm. they, they don't, I don't get the, I don't think I get the bad name out there that has kind of come around a few times. It, mm -hmm. it, it, I certainly got uh, lumped in mm -hmm. at first with that. And, and I've tried really, really hard. I remember um, one of the comments that still bugs me to this day, there was somebody that made a comment when I was running practices here at Gill mm -hmm. behind the plan. Uh, that when I did that, that had nothing to do with Gill. Mm -hmm. it, my, it was my club, my, you know, the USATF, the, we were, Gil was the additionally insured. Mm -hmm. uh, David Hodge was just gracious enough to let me because mm -hmm. I was displaced when uh, Urbana High School was redoing their track. Mm -hmm. That's where I used to run everything. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a, somebody had made a comment that uh, Brian is a, a jerk. He won't let anybody come back there and try the equipment or something like that. I'm like, well, no, like, what? right. He, he just, they didn't understand right. uh, how everything was structured. Right. And, and that always bugged me. Like to this day, that, that you yeah. remember how long ago it's been mm -hmm. since it's been back mm -hmm. there. And, uh, and so I, I, maybe I try a little too hard not to, to, to make sure that people understand mm -hmm. that, that I respect the school season. Um, and it's probably why I'm able to, I have pole vaulters that train year round with us. Mm -hmm. You know, they all take a break. I encourage them to, I, I remind them uh, that, that I fully expect them to do more than one sport. Mm -hmm. You know, take a break from pole vaulting, mm -hmm. take a break from track, go play volleyball or softball or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and, and uh, uh, you know, don't quit everything just to pole vault. So, or I mean, jump or obviously, and we, you know, we we said it from the get go. We're going to talk a lot about pole vaulting, um, and it is a uh, if an addiction can be positive then it certainly is an addiction for you. And sense of, I mean, tattoo, 
uh, doing it in the Marines, uh, getting cut from the middle school team, but yet still going, I I'm going to try this pole vault some more. Uh, and then, you know, working here at Gill and being involved in, uh, you know, pole production and pole creation, pole testing, uh, some of the symposiums we've done. I mean, it is like, your initials should be PV, <laughs> not BC, right? Uh, going along with that, so you mentioned you'd had a son. So you, you have two boys, uh, Brandon and Tyler, and uh, Brandon being the older one. Both of them pole vaulted. How much did you force them to become pole vaulters? Well, you've heard this story before. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, I never did. I like. I told my both my boys like I, I had seen you know in, in the club world you're you're going to see those parents that kind of push their kids into something. And, and I, and I don't, and I'm not necessarily saying you shouldn't encourage your kids or give them some guidance or, or a little push towards, uh, towards trying some new things, but we've all seen the, the parent who it's pretty clear. They're like living out vicariously. Through it's not about the kid. Guys, it's about the parent you know, mm -hmm. or they're, they're a little over the top in their competitiveness or, you know, and there's lots of stories out there. Um, and you can, find lots of cool videos of what's going on. Uh, so, so with my boys, I, I knew that in advance. Um, and I just kind of told them, do, do I want you to run track? I absolutely do. Do I want you to pole vault? I would love that. Mm -hmm. I think it, I, it would be awesome if you did. Uh, but if you do, I, I'm trying to think, I think it was Coach Adig, whose son pole vaulted. And he basically told him, I will not coach you until you ask me to. Oh, okay. Uh, so I told, you know, and, and I was like, well, how did that work out? He goes, well, he came to me his senior year and he wanted to win state. And mm -hmm. so he asked me to coach him mm -hmm. and he won state. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, if I had coach Adig as a dad, I'd have, <laughs> Hey, I think I'm going to pull vault. You're going to be my coach. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Rick Adig. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so I kind of took that, you know, I took that story from him and I, I said, well, that makes a lot of sense. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I let him know that I would be excited if they wanted to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they were really young, people would go, oh, your dad coaches, and, uh -huh. you know, you're going to pull ball. And uh, my wife tells the story best because she makes the face that, that my oldest son used to make. He's like, no, oh, I'm not going to pull. You know, he, uh, and then he, he uh, one day he came up to uh, his mom and said, I, I think I want to try pole ball. How so, old? Uh, and we're talking about Tyler, junior, right? or I'm sorry, Brandon, right? Junior high. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So still early. Like yeah. he'd wait till senior year to say, let me try vaulting. Right. And he says, I think I want to try to pull vault. And, and, you know, mom says, uh, well, you should tell your dad. But it's funny. He went to mom, not yeah. dad, right? <laughs> and, and, he, and he looked at her and he goes, would you do it? You know, like he wanted, and, because uh, I was still running the club. I still had, you know, at the time we did uh, like 12 practices in the armory mm -hmm. in the winter. And then, of course, had the summer, the summer practice. Well, I, I remember all of this is, I mean, you are at a, a runway, if you will, a pit 24-7. I mean, I remember when... Uh, my first few years here, we're running the factory vault out in the back, which is now our factory, by the way, you know, we expanded. Yeah. And, you know, this little kid comes up to me and just starts playing. And like, you know, I, I kind of love kids. And so I started playing back and I remember, you know, somehow like we're rough housing a little bit and I got him upside down, you know, I got him by his ankle and, and I, and I kind of started realizing I'm like, who, whose Which kid is this? this? I, like, I don't even know. And so I'm like, Hey, who's your, like, who's your parent? Like, where's your parents at? I'm like, oh, my dad's down there. And he pointed down at the pit, you know, we were up on that berm or whatever. And, uh, and I was like, who? And this, this is definitely my second year. Cause was, I, was, I was going on a date with Amy that night, my now wife. And uh, so I knew you, but didn't know you. It had to be the first year. Cause I knew you, but didn't know you know you, I guess. But I certainly didn't know everybody. And so he's pointing down at the pit and he's like, yeah, the guy in the white shirt. And I was like, wait, your dad is Brian? Like, wait a minute, I work with him. Uh, and it was just so like, like, that's their, that was their whole life. They were always around vaulting and vaulters. So it's interesting that it, it kind of both, like, cause you can, you know, you hear the stories and you alluded to them, you know, the, the kids who, uh, Amando, for example, who also was around vaulting literally in the womb, right. And gravitated very well to vaulting. And then you hear of other stories of like, oh, you know, my dad's a vaulter. Well, then that's the last thing. And, and you and put, put anything in vaulter, not just vaulting, right. Uh, my dad's a, a musician. Well, I, I will do everything, but being a mute, you know, those kind of things. So his junior year, he finally says, oh, okay, maybe I should try this. So oh. how, how did it go for him? Did he get cut his first week? No, no, no. Uh, no, it wasn't his junior year. 
Uh, no, no, a, a junior high. Yeah, Sorry, junior yeah, I missed up. Junior high. So, so uh, that's where I was going with the cut because of junior. High. Well, you know, it's kind of the, the personality differences uh, between you and your own kids. Um, you know, I, I he wanted me to coach him, uh, so I gave him that option. Uh, we he he was a lot like me, uh, a lot more than my youngest is, and, and we mom had to step in a few times and say, you know, you guys got to quit bringing practice home. Uh, <laughs> There was at one point, um, you know, anybody who's coached their own kid, uh, it, it, I've been lucky enough that I kind of had the, the traditional kind of um, difficulties with, with coaching Brandon, but I've been really lucky with my younger son, Tyler. He's just coachable. And I think mm. it's partially because he lived through mm. dad and brother. And he got to see mom. it yeah. firsthand. And, and, you know, he's, he's stubborn and, and but. You know, ultimately, I, I like to think that uh, uh, even though Brandon and I had our our differences in in at the track, uh, he ultimately chose to vault for Illinois. You know where I was coaching, mm -hmm. so he he could have avoided that very easily. Uh, right. Uh, so so he. But did. but even before that, how successful was he in high school? Oh, I mean, he uh, he progressed very well, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he won state as a a junior. Um, and then his senior year, he was the number one vaulter and had a, mm -hmm. we all have a slip up at some point. And, uh, didn't do so well in the finals, mm -hmm. uh, the, his senior year, but, um, uh, you know, his junior year was just a, a fascinating event for us. And we were kind of sitting up in the stands, keeping track of the X's and O's. Mm -hmm. and, uh, at the, the winning height, uh, he clears on, I want to say his first attempt. And there were like 12 people left in the competition. So we sat there through miss after miss after miss. I was like, all right, he's in first place. You know, there's, surely there, there's two or three kids that are going to make this, mm -hmm. this height. And we're going to, but he got a first attempt make. Everybody missed their first attempt. He's in a great spot going to the next height. All right. Because uh, he, he was jumping really close to his PR at that point where he cleared. Uh, third attempts come around, miss, miss, miss. I'm like, he's in the top eight. And, you know, of course, it's it, it's a really difficult situation as a parent and as a coach to, you're like, he's doing better because people are are missing. You, mm -hmm. you feel bad, especially sitting there in the stands right. where you know you're around everybody else's parents. So we're, we're trying to mm -hmm. be really reserved about our excitement about Root, what's going on. Root for Brandon, not against the other kids. Right. So, so you know, it goes on and he's eight, he's seven. He's six, he's fifth, he's fourth. And you know, this is like, don't say anything, don't say anything. Their parents, I'm sure, is your grandma and grandpa right behind us probably. It's just going to happen to be that way. And, uh, and sure enough, and it's, it's also kind of anticlimactic because, you know, his big moment was 25 minutes earlier when he cleared that height. And then here we had to wait all this time. And the way nobody else cleared. And that's how he stayed his junior year. So you've had a lot of successes in your life both personally and athletically you've done some pretty cool things what was it like coaching your son to a state title i mean there's not many state champions in this world man what was that like when when it did 25 minutes later it was known he was the state champion i, I mean it's it's as as exciting as you could imagine it is mm. I mean, it's it's just um I, I don't i think i would have been just as excited for him as whether I was his coach or not, I mm -hmm. mean, just seeing your, your, your child succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and that year, honestly, if he'd have placed in the top eight, I think I would have been just as excited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was hard to really uh, process that he won. Right. You know, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, you know, it really, it was so unexpected. Right. And, and again, in such a weird way, you know, for somebody who's been in the sport, you know, seeing an event end like that is just kind of like, that was a lot of right, right. So, so yeah, and, and he he couldn't watch. I think the, uh, when it got down to like the last three kids, he just turned it back <laughs> and put his head on the fence, sure, and just waited, and, and he would hear wow. the crowd like, oh, <laughs> you know, I remember kind of seeing that on his face. That's the cool thing about the pole vault; you can pretty much just listen to the crowd, and you'll kind of know yeah. what's going on. Yeah, so. Uh, Brandon, and he goes on to uh, walk on to the U of I team, right? Yeah. He vaults there, and you're the volunteer coach there at that time. That was awesome. And how much younger your second son? So he's kind of in the in the wings back. How, how much younger yeah, is Tyler? Same, same thing. Uh, you know, 
there's a, a, a bit of an age difference there, but you know, Tyler was same same way. I don't want pole vault. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tyler was uh, really excelling in cross country. He, he, mm, he got, that's right. Yeah, he got second at state mm -hmm. uh, as a, as an eighth grader, so he's almost as good as me in cross country. You're just <laughs> I'm letting it go. Uh, letting it go. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but you know, kind of not real interested in in pole vault. He had, you know, obviously it's hard to to be around that big fluffy pit thing and not play mm -hmm. on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so there's certainly some video and some photos of of him. How much younger is he than Brandon? Oh, you would ask that. <laughs> Remember, eight I said no. In seven, the eight years. years. Okay. So when, when, when Brandon was winning as a junior, Tyler is still yeah. eight years old, roughly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but, but he would come, you know, to practice and he would mm -hmm. pick up a crossbar. Uh, Tyler was, um, Tyler was the one that would go like get chalk on his hands and go put handprints on everybody's spandex. You know, <laughs> it was always funny that I was telling the story of the, the, the girl vaulters at Illinois. They, have these little tiny hand prints on their span. <laughs> like, um, but uh, so, so kind of a, uh, even a weirder story for him was hmm. in six, so in sixth grade uh, was when he started pole vaulting. Oh, okay. And I had nothing to do with it. Uh, he's out at, he's out at practice. Was it sixth or seventh? It was seventh grade. And uh, so he's out at practice and uh, Lance Liggett was a, a kid that vaulted for um, Urbana High School, uh, where, where uh, uh, Tyler went to, and Brandon both went mm -hmm. to Urbana Middle School and, and High School. Um, and uh, he's over there teaching, you know, he's coaching the, the high school, or the junior high vaulters. And he just like looks over, he's like, Tyler, come here, show him how to do this drill. I know you know how to do it. And so Tyler trots over there and, and just kind of, you know, he's seen it a million times. Right. So he, he grabs a pole and he goes up in the air. He doesn't really know what he's doing, but does a lot of things right, you know, uh, modeling, you know, he's already got it. Right, stuff. right. And uh, so, so Lance puts a bar up and shows, has him go over a bar. And so now he's doing it, but doesn't realize he's doing it. Really. Right. So, and suddenly he's jumping high enough to qualify for state. And uh, Lance goes, you know how high that was? And he's like, I don't know. If you jump that in the meet next week, you would go to state. Huh. He was like, hooked. Is that like, right? Is so, that right? So he goes, Interesting. To, he goes to sectionals and does not jump high enough. To oh, no. <laughs> so, so not, but now it's in it, man. He is, yeah. he is like, I am going to go to state. And of course, any uh, one state is his eighth grade year. Mm -hmm. um, and we go to, go to high school and he's improving a ton. And he, should have been more prepared about my own kids. Uh, <laughs> we go so the the first year he went to state in seventh grade because in Illinois you can compete as a seventh grader. Sixth and seventh graders compete in seventh grade state. All right. So it definitely was a sixth grade year that he didn't make it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm out. He makes the state, and I'm trying to borrow poles because mm. he just progressed so fast. And I don't have the right poles. It's funny the it, the Gill guy is that a pole? Yeah, what exactly. the heck, man? Yeah, around, it was embarrassing. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, so over the summer he's maturing and he's getting better. And and uh, his so his freshman year, so his older brother um, Urbana does a, a sign on the the football fence, the fence to mm. state champ. Mm -hmm. And so Tyler was like, I really want a sign next to my brothers. Yeah. And uh, uh, so the his freshman year he comes in and he's jumping pretty good and uh, does okay at the the indoor unofficial state mm -hmm. the prep top times meet and but then he he's really like a super intense competitor uh like if he's got somebody to jump with he always jumps better so he gets to this he gets to the state meet here's this little scrawny freshman and there's some pretty good vaulters out there um and he he just kind of keeps in there. He just hangs in there with everybody. He starts PR and he's jumping. I'm like, man, he, he got his first 15 foot jump at, uh, uh, the, uh, at Muhammad, uh, in the, the qualifying round, the, mm -hmm. the sectionals, um, as a freshman, as a freshman, 15 feet. Yeah. And, uh, so we get to state and he qualifies through. I, so you, you know, this part, cause, uh, when he was at state, we were at the NCAA championships. Yes. Uh, we were early 
and I did not go back home for the qualifying round. Uh, and you asked, how did he do? And I oh, said, you know, man. I did. I lied to you. And you felt awful or something. You know, I think I that's, I, I, I like this story because it's, it shows the empathy, empathy, <laughs> imp the pathetic, no, no, empathy, 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 the empathy side for me, because okay. Yeah, you, you didn't go to qualifying. And so the next day or next morning, whatever. And I, I was like, hey, how did I qualified? I would have stayed. Right. The rest of and I really did want you to stay because we still had some work to do. We were at Texas, yeah, I think. We were at, at UT Austin. And uh, I was like, hey, so how did, how did Tyler do? And let me tell you what, if they would have given, uh, what do they give for actors and actresses? Oscars? Is that what they give them? If they had given an Oscar for any performance at the track meet, you would have won because you turned to me. You, 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 you read very a person serious, by their very. eyes in your eyes. I don't know how you even kind of had like a little red. It's probably the sunburn from yeah. being in Austin, but and you're like, yeah, he no hide it. And, and you know, I had been, and it was jokingly like, I, I don't think I ever said, I hope he no hides, but I was like, man, I really want you to stay. Cause we got to get a lot of work done. And you're the, you're the hoss here, man. And you're like, yeah, he no hide it. And you know, I, I just felt terrible. Like, Oh my goodness, this kid who, is like killing it you know 15 feet as a freshman yeah he's, he's he's he could win it and he no heights and i was just like oh my god and you turned away quickly I did. and i was like oh my god brian's devastated and i you know at that point this is 12 years of working I with you. Away from you for a little while I, I was like i've never seen in 12 years i've never seen even close to this from brian like oh my god brian is rightfully so devastated for his son and then you came back and you're like man i'm just kidding man i'm leaving <laughs> i'm leaving tomorrow or tonight or whatever he he, he made it and i was like you I'm gonna say so, booger, but I'm pretty sure I did not call you no. booger that day. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I caught a uh, uh, very, very early flight the next morning. Yeah, like a 5 a.m. at Austin. Drove think, yeah. from yeah. like a bad yeah. from Indianapolis yeah. to uh, straight to Charleston and got there just in time for warm ups. Wow. Like it was like to the minute, I think. Wow. And, um, for the finals. And he just, got in there and started just kind of kept up with everybody and uh equaled his pr at 15 feet um and i i'm man, i'd have to go back to the x's and o's to be sure but uh there were two guys that, that definitely had better prs than him and and they both went out and then he and so like he he probably wasn't favored to win mm -hmm. like everybody knew that he was coming on and mm -hmm. he was going to probably you know be somebody to keep an eye on for the next few years and uh, but then uh, the he jumped fifteen six, uh, and then the so the school record was fifteen nine. So we went to was it Brandon's? No, oh Brandon there, High there School was record. Okay, Walter, okay. Uh, previous that Brandon right. was really close to setting the school record. Mm -hmm. but just never quite got mm -hmm. there. Um, Hit his senior year, he probably could have. Mm. No height at state. Mm -hmm. That was he, that was really where we he was right. right. Um, and uh, so he, I was like, well, so kind of the 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 peak of a of a pole vault competition is if if you out jump everybody, and you really you know you kind of know you you used a lot of jumps and mm -hmm. and you're you're but you're going to finish out this last height, but you're not going to go any further. All right. And so like the 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 pinnacle of vaulting is to end on a make. Right. You almost always end on three misses. Right. That's just the way it yep. is. Well, Bart put the bar up at 15, 10, and I told him, I said, hey, you've taken quite a few jumps. Your, you know, your energy level is there. You make this, you're done. Yeah, school you record. Quit. Yeah, just yeah. you make this, quit. And uh, uh, we had actually chosen a height that was a school record, and it was going to be the best vault by a freshman in the nation that year, oh, like nice. looking it up. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, he, he clears it, uh, wow. does his little backflip on the pitch with, that grandma loves to see. And <laughs> he looks down at uh, uh, the official and just says, I'm, I'm done. Awesome. Because like, the official was like, what do you want to go yeah, to Yeah, what's next? Like, right. I'm done. Wow. And uh, he got to end on a make. Wow. Uh, and of course, the sad side of all this, as you know, is, is uh, uh, later that year, he Came down with mono, mm, uh, missed his entire that's sophomore right. year, missed that's his right. entire junior year. Uh, just the mono was away, but yeah, he had a, ended up finding out he had a, a narrow airway, mm. um, and so he had sleep apnea. So for his 18th birthday, he literally got a CPAP. <laughs> Happy birthday! On, on his birthday. <laughs> uh, and then of course, uh, 
last year was his senior year. Yeah. So back, ready to, you know, book in. Uh, we were talking about booking mm -hmm. state champs. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, course, freshman, senior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, Corona took All that right. season away. Oh, man. And, uh, but he's continued to train and jump, and he's, he's now a, a, a 17 foot vaulter. Wow. And uh, we, take, we took a gap year. Um, really scary decision. You know, anytime you hear a kid say, I'm going to take a year off yeah. to go to college, how often do they go? Right. And, of course, there wasn't a worldwide pandemic. They <laughs> chose to do yeah. it. Little extenuating you know, circumstances. So, yeah. So uh, he's very excited. We were, we talked to a handful of schools. In fact, uh, one of the missed calls I had a few minutes ago was one of the colleges we've been. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, so he's going through like a recruiting year. Yeah. Getting ready for next year. No more. No two gap years, right? Just one gap year. Yeah. So so as as uh yeah definitely not. <laughs> um, but you know as a as somebody who's coached and recruited and stuff the. The last year was really, really odd. I, I've mm -hmm. actually called several coaches and going, you know, what the heck? Mm -hmm. Like, you can't have any in-person visits, but you can make phone calls. I don't know how you guys aren't like burning up the phone mm -hmm. right now. And I just think it's the it it's nobody was used to how recruiting has to be done right now. Right. Because uh, now this year it, it's you know picked up. I'm, I'm talking to kids. We had a good a, a good female vaulter that. Um, as a senior this year and, and of course as a junior wasn't getting a lot of calls and stuff I'm saying, mm -hmm. i would be burning the phones right. up right like just calling everybody because it's a, the only way anybody can make can establish that that recruiting relationship is over the phone right, right. now and uh it just wasn't happening and, and some of it um you know a lot of i, I know tyler uh a lot of people thought tyler was just going to come to illinois mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't coach for illinois as of this year so mm -hmm. Um, it's it's picked up since the word about that has gotten out because they just thought no matter what why would mm -hmm. I call him he's right. gonna go to Illinois no matter what is there any shot Tyler could go to the greatest university in the world Troy University no none no. you know actually it's probably no. that's uh, as a diehard Troy guy that hurts a little bit to be real honest with you but but I completely understand a couple of episodes ago we had uh, Dwayne Ross from NCA and T on the show and he also coaches his son and daughter were studs like 45 second quarter and 11 and a half second hundred. And they're both on his team uh, coaching there. But, you know, you, you made the same kind of face when I brought it up to him about like, you know, coaching your kid, like, you know, we go through as coaches and we all have those kids that just mean the world to us for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, their development or uh, background, et cetera, or just, you know, their, their gym ratness, you know, they're always in there working hard for you, but to coach your kids, like I can't even, you know, I'm, I'm the father of a 10 and a seven. So I can't even fathom because I certainly am not coaching T-ball and kid soccer and all that. Uh, probably be as good as someone that coaches those. You know, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm still wondering. If, you know, one of my two kids decides to do track uh, in high school and stuff, and I'm the dad in the, in the stands, you know, cause I, you know, quite like you, you know, I coach at a pretty high level. It's like, can I be the dad that just, just shuts up and lets them do, or am I going to be the guy going, Hey man, uh, you, you know what you need to be doing here. You got to be doing X, Y, and Z. I don't know what kind of track dad I'm going to be just yet. Well, I, you know, there, I have learned to, in the pole community, it's, it's not uncommon to go to a meet and there'll be, you know, one or two guys there that just start, they just step in and coach everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, at the college level, that has happened, but I think those people, like, to a certain degree, you got to mind your own business. Sure. Right? So, so as much as you want to, sometimes you just step back, unless it's something really, really yeah, egregious. Safety like, egregious. Yeah, safety egregious, right, right, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Or you just know that if, if they continue down that path, that, right. uh, they're just going to keep getting kids injured. Mm -hmm. You know, the, mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's where I kind of drew the line. Yeah. Like, you, you just go to meets and you just see. I'm one of those people that I, I would step in and, and mm -hmm. coach anybody, but I learned early on um, that I, I wait to make sure like they don't have somebody coaching them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've learned to just kind of first ask, like, mm -hmm. hey, uh, I notice you don't have your coach here. If if mm -hmm. I could, you know, if you don't, if you don't mind, I, I'd be happy to catch right. you know, your staff or mm -hmm. give you a few pointers or whatever. And they're usually like, yeah. oh my gosh, that would be awesome. Yeah. You know, or or you learn like, oh yeah, my coach is over getting a hot dog right now. He'll be, here. oh okay, good luck to you today. You yeah, know, you just kind of learn where to where to back off because, you know, I 
I had been the guy that um, maybe stepped on a toe or two mm -hmm. at a meet when I was younger, and and uh, that's never fun either. Yeah, you, you, I know, I know those guys have the best of intentions, mm -hmm. um, but you know just what you see in that one thirty minute period may not have anything to do with what that athlete and coach right. team have been working on for months right you know that, that's just a very small snapshot of what's going on just it doesn't hurt to mind your own business sometimes i, I bring it up quite often but when we had brooks johnson on the podcast last year you know one of the many things that he said that stuck with me was if you're not in the huddle you don't know the play <laughs> and it just always stuck with me like oh you know what outside looking in i don't know what's going on with that kid in his life or that coach and what they're working on you know it's uh, there's so much more going on than what you're seeing in that snapshot, like you put it. That's a good way of putting it. Well, man, Brian, dude, uh, we could do this for a few hours. You know that because there's a lot. First of all, you're welcome, listener. There are a lot of inside jokes we just did not go into. Thank goodness. Probably more for me. You know, you, you've you've got to deal with me every week uh, on the podcast. I don't want you thinking poorly of me and some of the stories that Brian has uh, on me. He, he, he boards them over me. But uh, honestly, Brian, you know, this is exciting uh, to be able to have you on the, on the show because, you know, a lot of times we focus on the athletes, rightfully so they're doing, uh, you know, some amazing, amazing performances out there, or, you know, what we really like to focus on here at Gills, the coaches, and, you know, we see the, uh, the guys and gals that are out there that are getting it done at the national meets and conference meets. I'm always interested in these kind of behind the scenes folks. Right. Um, we had Stephen Madrid, you know, he's a friend of ours at the Albuquerque Convention Center. We had him on early in the, in the show. So awesome to, to be able to highlight and um, uh, honor the things that he does for our sport that no one, no one really knows. You don't see a Stephen Madrid. So a guy like you, you know, and, and you're a little bit more public facing in the sense of, you know, coaching and things like that. And obviously having, uh, you know, two great kids that are, you know, college bound and things like that. But to know the impact that you have made in, in the sport of track and field, uh, and even more specifically the event of, of pole vaulting. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's a little known fact of most people will never know just how much you have affected this sport in positive ways, man. So it's just, it's just so cool to, to be able to share your journey. Well, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, coming into this interview and, and just so everybody knows you didn't give me the questions in advance or mm -hmm. anything. This is all, you know, totally, straight off the hip uh you know, i kind of expected like who are your mentors mm -hmm. kind of the general stuff and um you know the my mentors in track and field or in pole vault in particular uh joe dial mm -hmm. awesome joe, love him uh, uh, really kind of taught me the um that there's more than one way to mm -hmm. to coach an event like uh i mean you get some people who get very locked in and into their ways and they don't they don't identify the individual strengths and, and play to those. And I think Joe does a great job of that. Uh, plus Joe is just an amazing character. Just one of those guys that I could sit and just talk to. For he is day. awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Jan Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Jan's a, probably one of the biggest personalities in the event mm -hmm. uh, in, in good ways and bad. I know he rubs some people the wrong way, but we all do. I, I always say when I, in the recruiting process, you used to always tell people like, you can't recruit, you can't coach everybody. Hmm. You know, personalities still exist. Um, and the bigger the personality, you know, the, the more you're, you're going to likely to, to hmm. maybe rub some people wrong, the wrong way sometimes. I know I do. Um, and uh, Earl Bell. You know, hmm. Earl, Earl yeah, Bell, of I course. Was, I was, I grew up uh, in the, uh, the era of, um, Every pole vaulter in the nation that was worth a darn, even those those of us who weren't, uh, always made that that annual trek to Bell Athletics. The mecca, go to to Jonesboro, Arkansas. The, yeah, <laughs> the, just just going down there and, and absolutely uh, uh, spending a few days and jumping and 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 just getting to spend some time with Earl. Um, that was, was just amazing. Yeah, and, and they, they really helped. I mean, I had some huge influences on my on my coaching personality and in, in some of the you know again being with John and John and then coming over and, and working with Gary and mm -hmm. Gary Winky and Gary Winkler. Mm -hmm. uh, those four right there. Yeah. Like, to be able to, to be one of, I think I'm the only coach that, that was under all four of them, oh, right. you know, over the, over the years. Uh, what is just, I, I can imagine a, a better mentors in my career. Now you mentioned uh, 
Madrid from Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. To make sure that everybody knows that they want the best burger. In Albuquerque. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There's now a- we're in the portion of the show where we do go through all the uh, inside, not not jokes. This isn't a joke. There's this a- is the one of the best places in Albuquerque. We're we're going back right in twenty three or twenty four. Yeah. Albuquerque's hosting again. So when you're there, but this is also embarrassing to admit to that we just discovered that the reason that bar is named what it is was the last time we were there. Yeah. What Even was that? Gone. The the person the the oh, they were from, from Illinois. Effingham, Illinois. Yes. So the, the name of the, the restaurant is the Effing Burger. And we had gone there every time we've been. To Absolutely. Albuquerque Best burger years. in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, ama- just amazing food. And the place got better every time we went. Yep. They would Great be, service. Yeah. yeah, everything. Uh, and the last time we went, we're sitting there reading the menu, only That's to right. read that, that the person who founded the bar the reason it's called the effing burger wasn't what we thought yeah we thought effing freaking burger right 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 they were from effingham like, illinois like when we like that's how we and i say we you picked it we were like where are we going to dinner and you're like Random. hey man let's let's find something local you're like i found i found this place and it's got the greatest name in the world so we have to go and i was like all right what's it called and he's like you know it's the effing burger and i was like ah freaking burger all right whatever well, let's go and it was good and then yeah years later like six seven eight years later we're, we're finally back. reading the story yeah and it's a guy in effingham which is what hour down the road yeah because yeah, charleston's 45 i was gonna say 45 hour. but yeah an hour down the road that's where the the guy who created and our we, favorite burger joint we'd always in new mexico for sure burgers some effing fries and effing beer all right so if anybody <laughs> that's right if anybody's still listening i have to get brian to tell this story I debated. So I woke up at three o'clock this morning thinking of all the stories, Brian. I was, I was giddy for this. You know, you know what's really interview. bad is I don't even know which one you're going to Oh, ask exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. That's right. Um, and I'm not even, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of involved, but I want to hear from your mouth because I've told this story a hundred times. Uh, you're in Las Vegas and you're stuck because there's a snowstorm here in Champaign. We're down there, cele- you're down there celebrating the 40th birthday of a good friend of ours, uh, Mike Fontana, one of our dealers, great uh, pole vault. Of course, it's pole vault related uh, up, and up in uh, St. Charles, Illinois. And you get stuck in Las Vegas, which, you know, Vegas is near and dear to my heart. I used to ice, live there. storm, in O'Hare, everything's iced over, all the flights are Yeah, you down. can't, yeah, he We're calls. Text messages like. He calls people. So I'm at the office. He calls me, he's like, man, I'm stuck. I can't get home. I'm like, you need to get back and get to work. Like, what are you doing, man? We're, you know, we got stuff to do. And he's like, dude, I'm stuck. I'm like, you're in Las Vegas. You ain't stuck. And it's like, no, that's iced and no hair. And I knew it was cold. You know, this is January, February, but you know, what an excuse. Right. But then he calls me the next day to tell me about his escapades the night before. So tell us about what you got into and how it went down. Uh, we went to a, a, a wing place called Dante's Inferno. Was it in Circus Circus? Uh, you don't even remember that part. All right. So, okay. Goes to a wing place in a, what was the name of the, the wing place? Dante's Inferno. Dante's Inferno. Okay. So yeah. you, you go to get wings. Big deal. What's the story? And yeah. You know, I, I'm kind of a hot sauce guy. People See, I'm going to interrupt every time. So he's not kind of a hot <laughs> sauce guy. The, Brian is one of the, you know, those people that um, collect all the, you know, if you have ever seen hot sauces, right? We're not talking about just Tabasco and uh, um, what's the red stuff I eat now? Uh, red hot. No, no, no. Red hot. Uh, no, no, no. The uh, Sriracha. We're talking about all these crazy, you know, 10 alarm type stuff, right? That's who Brian is. He, for a long time, you probably still do. He used to have these little MRE Tabascos aligning his desk. Like he's, he's proud of this. Military MREs. We would, you always felt lucky if you got the little bottle. He's proud of this love of hot sauces. So what do you do in Dante's Inferno wing bar? Well, uh, as with most, you know, uh, wing places, they have like a super hot, kind of mm-hmm. wing and yeah like a bw3s it's yeah. a habanero or something right and at the top one yeah and then yeah uh, hooters have like the three mile island yeah right whatever. okay mm-hmm. yeah. so uh uh the I, I think the waitress came by and said something about a, a wing challenge you know i kind of read about this wing challenge now we've heard about your competitive streak yeah. so did that yeah. so so i i i read a little bit about it um, you got to 
they come out with whole waiver thing and all this. But before I really agreed to do it, because I was so hungry, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes the hot ones would just taste awful, you know. So I, I and since I Dante's wasn't necessarily a chain that I know of, mm -hmm. I've never had it, and I'm I'm thinking, well, I'm hungry, and I don't want to get a terrible bunch of wings. All right. <laughs> so, but meanwhile, I'm there with with Fontana mm -hmm. and, and uh, Colin Beatty and, mm -hmm. and uh, with uh, PB Elite and my wife. And I, I start, so they have this wall of fame, okay, from the the, the wing challenge. Right? All the people that have, yeah, have completed. what is it? Is this a ten wings? Yeah, what are we talking ten, about? Ten, ten, ten wings. Ten of their their hottest wings. And so in there's this 30, hall of fame. Thirty minutes or something. And you're like, oh, I want my picture right there. But so I, I get up and I walk over and I check out the hall of the, the wall of fame. And then right next to it though is the wall of shame. Oh and it's and it's literally like they take your picture and they say only eight one. And it's like, oh, you know, you're sure, yeah, yeah. And I and I look and I'm like, oh my gosh, like there's this grandma up here on the wall that had I think it was three. Okay. Three. I could at least eat I gotta be eating. like stereotypical grandma, white yeah. hair. Yeah. yeah. This is this is our grandma here. Probably in her eighties, easy. You and know, you were like, like I, I can beat and, her. And she didn't look terrible uh, off from it, and I thought, well, at the very worst, I, I could be grandma. I said, I, I, I don't know that I'll be able to eat all ten. Mm -hmm. We'll see. So I agree to do the wing challenge. Did anybody try to stop you? Your wife is oh, with no, you, right? Come on. You know, you, Lori didn't stop you. I know Fontana didn't try to stop met, you. You met Colin. Colin and, didn't stop and, you. But and Michael. No and one was like your, were, your good angel sitting on your shoulder. Not only did they encourage me, I firmly believe they hoped it, would, it <laughs> went exactly like it did. Exactly like it did. <laughs> so, that's, that's true friends right there. I love that. Yeah. So, uh, so they bring out the, the little waiver thing and I sign it. No concerns that you have to sign a waiver. I mean, that's kind of is that standard i've never common little okay. wing challenge thing you know. uh, now these are these are ghost pepper wings they are is that what the yeah. flavor was called what you know there's habanero well, there's was ghost pepper yeah well the ghost pepper yeah the hottest peppers is what they use to spice this up yeah um so this is like a million on the scoville units yeah, right that's how they measure this stuff yeah jalapenos i think are like uh 25 or 75 they're like extremely yeah. low this i think the ghost pepper starts at a million yeah so so they bring out the the wings and they set them down and you know you it burned to sniff them and i was just like all right we're gonna do this and no backing off you're not like yeah you know what uh mistake no well you're like still i'm gonna be grandma back to my competitor streak i knew it was a mistake yeah, there was no doubt about it um <laughs> But I'm like, okay, and, and so and so, yeah. Just like I, the story I've told you before, in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, there's a wall of shame up there. I gotta eat at least more than three. Right. I, I there's no way I can put my photo up on that wall right. with less than three next right. to grandma. Right. <laughs> so I, I, you know, eat the first one and hits pretty good instant regret oh, when you yeah. buy, when first bite you're like oh snap I, I, not first bite it, okay the, the ghost pepper stuff you know you know it's hot mm -hmm. but it just kind of keeps going okay. it keeps going and pretty much doesn't stop it, it, <laughs> uh and so i'm just like now i'm I finished the first one I'm like oh are you crying this is terrible not yet the second one did I you make the mistake and rub your eyes yes yeah, the second one I'm okay. like, because now I'm starting to sweat a little bit. Oh, I try to, yeah. The, I try to dab, oh, no. Of course, now I've got, now I can't see. And, I, you know, and I know the time's going. And I'm like, oh my God, I haven't How the second one yet. How loud is Fontana and Lori and Collins laugh? Well, you know, during the second one, they were laughing pretty good. Uh, as I start trying to choke down the third one. Concern. Uh, they, they were like, you really don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God, let's let's grandma, talk him off the ledge. Like you didn't see grandma up there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I saw I've got it in my eyes. And finally, I, I, I eat the third one. Okay. And they do count halves. And so I got halfway through a fourth. So now I know I'm. Oh, so you did three and a half. Yeah. So you beat grandma. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And uh, so I go straight into the bathroom. I'm just like flushing my eyes out, washing my Gosh. hands. And, uh, and it, it, it was not smart it's a great it makes for a great story you know I, I always say the oh it sure does i always say you know the the when as you live life don't back away from things you know being on a jury was kind of a i don't want to be yeah. on a jury yeah. but it was an interesting experience right. being 
and selected to be the jury. Right. Member. Again, it's just an interesting uh, All right. it's experience. Yeah. You know, so um, this was, I could do without this life experience. Uh, I was about to say, there's got to be some. <laughs> later on, when. Let's keep it PG. Get, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Started to kick in. It was, who? So I, I really should have just known that. The next day, <laughs> it was that bad. The next day, you call me. It actually, it might have been a day after that because you had some recovery yeah. time and you know, you're telling me this and you're like, Mike, these things were the hottest thing in the whole yeah. world. And I was like, well, Brian, it's a challenge. Like, yeah. and I you had to know that. And you're like, it was ghost pepper, Mike. Like that's what they use in police grade. Um, it, it was actually, I, I, yeah, you're right. The, the, the way I described it to you is uh, if I had seasoned the wings with police grade pepper spray, yeah. <laughs> Like riot control pepper spray, right. it would have been less, less. Hot than what I actually <laughs> ate. So yeah, I do, I do remember the, using that analogy. Or it was awesome, man. Years. It was awesome. And then I was like, all right, that's awesome. Now get back to work, man. We're busy. Let's let's get to it. Hey, speaking of busy, we got to go. Yep. Uh, this has been a riot, man. I'm so thankful that we were able to sit down and do this. Honestly, uh, uh, you know, we've been teammates my whole time. I, you know, I'm going on my 15th year. I'm still a young buck compared to you. Uh, I have not gotten my 15 year plaque nor my 20 like you. So I'm, I'm a rookie essentially. Uh, but honestly, you know, as I look back over the 15 years and all the things that we've done from the fact, uh, field vaults to Olympic trials, uh, NCAA championships, working on R and D projects together, going back to the pole room and all the pole stuff and, you know, and everything I've learned about pole vaulting has been through you, honestly. Uh, I'm just honestly so thankful as a teammate of yours. And I know I can speak for thousands of customers who may never know your name in the sense of what you have done for them. Uh, but what, what positivity you brought and helped people really um, enjoy this great event of pole vaulting, man. So I'm just so thankful for you to be here today. And we've never even shared the story about, uh, pickup truck karaoke driving to Folsom prison. That'll, we'll have to save that one. For so folks, day. thanks for being here today. Uh, just like I am thankful for Brian, I am honestly just so thankful and humbled uh, that you'd be here for us today. And honestly, if you've made it this far, I am really, really, uh, well, I'm just kind of wondering what, what do you have to do during the day? If you're still with us today, you should, you should cut this off like 30 minutes ago, I think, but, uh, just so thankful, uh, that Brian would be here to stay, be with us here today. And honestly, just being so humble and authentic, uh, it's exactly what I'd expect from, from my teammate to be real real frank with you. Uh, so thankful for him for being here and thankful for you. If you found value in today's episode, uh, it's probably uh, a good bet that someone else would find value in it. So if you would uh, consider sharing this on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, smoke signals, whatever you use out there, uh, it would just mean the world to us to help uh, bring value to others out there. And uh, you know what, we're going to do this all over again next week. So join us, make sure you're subscribed. So you're the first one to know about the episodes. And let's, let's go back and have some fun. So have a great day. And thanks again for, for being here. Stop recording. If you're still here, we're not supposed to be recording. I hit the stop button. Come on. This is the part I, I can't edit this out. <laughs>